Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. This was back in 2015 or 2016. I'm a career tow truck driver. At this point, I've been towing cars for most of my adult life and will likely do so until I either retire or die, whichever comes first. At the time, I was working for a pretty small towing company with only two employees and we rotated who was on call each weekend. It was my weekend on call and it was summer. So with people being out and about late and whatnot, I was pretty busy cleaning up accidents, towing broken down cars, both in the city and off the highway. I was fine with it as I was paid commission at the time so the more calls I did, the more money I made. So it's Saturday night, now Sunday morning, and it's around 2.33 in the morning, and like I said, I've been busy, I'm tired, a little grumpy, and kinda wanna go home when my phone rings. It's an insurance company calling asking if we can do a tow for one of their customers who has broken down on the side of the highway. The breakdown location they give me is about 15 miles out of town, which I normally wouldn't do, but the tow destination happens to be a dealership that's just a couple of minutes from my apartment. I contemplate rejecting the call, but because I'm paid commission, I figure screw it. I could run up and grab this car, drop it off around the corner from my place, then hopefully I could head home and get a couple of hours of shut eye. So I take the call and hop on the highway. The insurance company provided me with the customer's first name, which we'll say was Kara, and gave me a phone number for her. Usually I try to make contact with people who are on the side of the highway to let them know I'm on my way and give them an ETA. I try calling her a couple of times, but she doesn't answer, not unusual. After a short while, I see hazard lights up the way on the shoulder, so I turn on my strobes and start slowing down. As I approach, I noticed that not only is there the late model car that I'm looking for, but there's another car on scene as well that doesn't have its hazards on, but it's parked in front of the car I'm meant to tow. This is annoying but not uncommon, as I need to be able to get in front of the disabled car in order to load it and sometimes people don't realize that, but because the other car is there, I instead pull up behind both cars. You do this so that as the tow driver, you're the one that has to make the weird maneuver of pulling off the shoulder and back onto the shoulder, and that the other car just has to drive straight forward on the shoulder. Otherwise, if I pulled up in front, then the other car would have to go around me and it's unprofessional and unsafe to make them do that. Standing in the trunk of the late model car, which is now directly in front of me, are a man and a woman. The woman is probably in her early 20s and dressed to the nines for a nine out. She's about 5 foot 1 or 5 foot 2. She's wearing tight leather-ish or something pants, a halter top, long black hair. The man is probably around 5 foot 10 and skinny, maybe 150 to 160 pounds, wearing a dark hoodie and dirty jeans. They're standing very close and facing each other. She has her arms crossed and he's leaning down talking to to her. I step out of my truck and approach them both, introduce myself. They separate a few feet and I look to the woman and say, are you Kara? She nods. I say I'm here for her insurance company and I ask what's going on with the car. Immediately, the man pipes up and says, yeah, it's just having some fuel issues. It's an easy fix. Can you just drop it off at this commuter parking lot? I'm gonna fix it for her there. I'm rather annoyed at this because the commuter lot in question is further up the highway and I'm already 15 miles out of town. Like I said before, I only took this call because it was supposed to be coming back toward my apartment and I really wanted to go home. Not only that, but in order to change the original tow destination, I would have to call the insurance company back, wait on hold for who knows how long for a representative, and then let them know the change and try to get them to pay me extra for the deadhead miles back home after unloading. And I really didn't want to do any of this. And thirdly, this is a late model car. I'm no mechanic, but it's new enough that whatever's wrong with it is likely covered under warranty, so the dealership is really the best place for it to go anyways. I explain all of this to the guy, but he's really not having it. He gets stern with me, saying something like, look man, you just need to take the car where I tell you to take it. We go back and forth on this for maybe 60 seconds and he's just getting madder. Well, you know what man, you're not the name insured, Kara is. The easy way to settle this is to ask what she wants me to do with the car, and whatever she says is what I'll do. Fingers crossed she'll want to take it to the dealership so I can get home sooner. I turn to look at Kara to ask her that question and I don't see her right away. She's no longer standing where she just was a minute ago, which was slightly off to my right. I continue to not see her until I've turned to almost all the way around because she's standing directly behind me and by directly I mean within an inch of my back arms still crossed I look down at her and she locks eyes with me her eyes are as white as plates almost owl like and immediately it feels like she's staring into my soul she didn't say a word and she didn't have to I took a step back and did what felt like a double double take I looked at him then at her then at him again and then back at her and it slowly started to dawn on me that maybe something isn't right I asked her do you know this guy and she ever so slightly shook her head no without a word the guy starts to move for Kara, and I move to stay in between them. He tries to push me out of his way by shoving me in the chest, but because I believe he underestimated my weight, only pushed me hard enough to make me take a single step back. Immediately, I took that step
step forward towards him and body check him hard, as hard as I could, hard enough to completely knock him over basically onto his back. Because we rotated during the back and forth push pit, Kara is now in front of me to my right, somewhat between me and the guy who's trying to scramble to his feet. I reached out and snatched the poor girl up by her waist, spun her towards my truck and yelled for her to get into the driver's side and she does so. I turn back to the guy who is standing up again at this point and he's breathing hard. He gets right up in my face but doesn't do anything, just breathes at me. I stare him right in his face and tell him you need to go. I'm shaking now and I'm absolutely terrified. I don't know if he has a weapon, I don't know if he's going to try to fight me, and I don't know what I would do if he did. After probably around 15 seconds or so, which felt like eons, he kinda huffs a bit, smiles one of the creepiest smiles I've ever seen, and starts to back off. Sucking his teeth and rubbing his hands together, he slowly walks backwards a few steps, then makes his way to the front car, gets in and drives off. I stayed motionless, watching him until I could no longer see his taillights. I got Kara's car loaded up on the tow truck, and as we made our way to the dealership, she told me through tears that her car had shut off while she was driving, and she pulled onto the shoulder and called her parents, because she was on their insurance. Her parents made the call to the insurance company, who eventually dispatched me to her location. While she was waiting, a bit after she made the call, the guy pulled up in front of her and walked up to her passenger side window to try to talk to her, asking if she needed help, etc. And she told him she was fine, that a tow truck was coming, and that she didn't need help. He persisted and she tried to tell him off, and eventually tried to roll up on the window. Apparently he stuck his arm in the window and got the door unlocked and opened the door. In fear, she jumped out of the car, leaving her phone inside, and ran to the back of her car and stayed put there because it was in the line of sight of traffic. Apparently he was pretty lewd with her, and whenever she tried to go back to the car, he would prevent her from getting in. Several minutes later, I showed up. Who knows what would have happened had the timing been any different. Her parents were waiting at the dealership when we arrived, and she told them what had just happened. Her parents gave me a $20 tip, which was all the cash they had on them at the time, and Kara gave me a very tight and clearly heartfelt hug before I left. I never saw her again. To set the tone, I always hated the town I lived in. I moved there alone when I was 18 for college and quickly regretted it. It was a decent sized town but full of not decent people. Nearly every gas station was robbed frequently, there were shootings in broad daylight, robberies, you name it. Well for the first three years I lived with roommates on a side of town that wasn't awful but it was sketchy. So when I was making decent enough money I moved out on my own. The house was tiny, maybe 500 square feet if that, super old and poorly built. It was just me living there so I didn't mind how small it was was, but what originally sold me was that it was in the middle of nowhere. It was surrounded by a bunch of fields and some wooded areas with only a few houses nearby. Considering I hated being in the town due to the continuous paranoia of getting mugged or shot, I loved the idea of living out there. So at the beginning of July I moved in. Everything seemed super swell minus not being able to get good internet. A month goes by and everything is still swell to me and I decided to get a dog to keep me company. He also loved the place and spent long amounts of time lounging about the yard and trying to convince the nearest neighbor to walk over and pet him. Important later. Roughly two months into living there, I started to notice things at a place. Something to note is that an old roommate of mine was using my spare room as a storage place until he got moved himself, so he had a key but was never there. He kind of just popped in every once every other week to grab something and usually let me know beforehand. But I'd come home to my kitchen chair being pulled away from my table, or a bowl in the sink, things like that. There were such small things I wrote off as my roommate swinging by or just stuff I was forgetting. But then my dog developed this crazy bad separation anxiety. Up until now he didn't even care when I left. He just lay on the couch and chewed his toys. He never barked, never did anything weird. However, all of a sudden he began acting really awful every time I tried to leave. He'd literally cram his body through the door as I was closing it, screaming and barking and wouldn't stop until I came back in the house. He didn't want me to leave him there alone, at all. I couldn't afford a kennel for him yet so I decided one day that I'd put a movie in while I was out, thinking maybe the sound of people talking might keep him calmed down. I only had to finish one task up at work and knew I'd be home early, so I put in a copy of Hamlet. I know, boring, but I chose it because the copy I have is 5 hours long. I knew it would be playing when I came back. Flash forward 3 hours, long before Hamlet should have been over, but when I walked in the door, not only was the movie not playing, but the TV and the Xbox were completely off. I immediately called my roommate and asked if he had been over, and he wasn't even in town. I explained the TV situation to him and he shrugged it off as the TV powering off when it idles for a while. Even though this is true, there are several reasons I know this isn't the case. 
One, it wasn't idling. A five hour movie was supposed to be playing. Two, even if it had shut off, my Xbox wouldn't have. I have left it on by accident for weeks I was gone out of town or whatever and it was still on when I came home. Always. But it was completely powered down this time. The weird thing is none of my stuff was missing and the door was locked when I entered. I eventually convinced myself that it was something weird with the Xbox or whatever and shrugged it off. That is until my dog started acting even weirder. Remember earlier I mentioned he used to play with a neighbor? Well, all of a sudden, if she even walked by the house while he was out, he'd start yelping and running at me away from her. This was incredibly weird to me and made me incredibly cautious of her. I put some cheap alarms on my doors, the kind that go off when the doors opened, and slept with my pistol handy. The second night the alarms were on my doors, I was woken up by the one on the back door going off. I flew out of my bed with my pistol, trying to convince myself that I was about to shoot some intruder, but once I got to the door it was shut and there was nobody there. The alarm had been knocked all the way across the room. The door would have had to open for it to be chucked like that. It couldn't have fallen off and landed there. Something else weird, the door was locked, but not the way I had locked it. I always locked the knob and the deadbolt, but upon checking my lock after this, only the doorknob was locked. The police wouldn't do much as I had no witnesses, no lead, and they didn't have much to go on. Needless to say, I changed the locks. I didn't have any noticeable problems inside after that, but later found out that the close neighbor that my dog hated had previously lived in the house I was renting, and the locks had never been changed. I have no way to prove my theory, but it's pretty obvious she had a key and was coming and going as she pleased. Why though, I can't figure out. Nothing of mine ever went missing. The most unsettling part for me though, is that she had tried to come in at night until the alarm scared her off. How many times has she been in my house at night while I was asleep, and why, not sure. Luckily though, I don't live there anymore and never plan to move back there. A while ago, I was staying in an upscale hotel in the safe area of a large midwestern city. I am a 16 year old female and I was in a room all by myself, with my parents a few doors down. In theory, this isn't unsafe by any means, but I had bad luck on this particular trip. Our first night there passed without incident. Me in my room, my parents in theirs. I watched a pay-per-view movie and ate way too much from the snack bar. I didn't have any reason to feel unsafe. The next morning, we did the usual tourist stuff that one does when visiting a new city. As we ate a breakfast in the hotel restaurant, I noticed a man who looked to be in his 60s staring at me for an abnormally long amount of time. I ignored it and chalked it up to him thinking I looked like his granddaughter or something. The next night, my parents allowed me to meet up with a friend for dinner who lived in the area. He met me in the hotel lobby and we had a nice dinner and then went back to the hotel for drinks. Yes, I am underage, I had a drink, my bad. Coincidentally, the same man who had been eyeing me earlier was at the bar. This time, I knew I didn't remind him of his granddaughter. Even with my buff guy friend next to me, his eyes traced my body. I felt unsettled and mentioned it to my friend, Ethan, who glanced over and also seemed really weirded out by how obvious this guy was leering. We left the bar quickly and by now it was around 12.30am. Ethan walked me to the elevators of the hotel and once I pushed the button, I left. I wish I would have asked him to stay, because no sooner had he walked away that my creeper came, rounding the corner, and stood there waiting with me for the elevator. I felt so uncomfortable knowing that he would be seeing what floor I was going to, but it hadn't occurred to me to get off on a different floor at the time, and even if it did, he planned on following me, so it would have been just as bad a move. When we were in the elevator together, I tried to keep my eyes averted from his, but they literally bored to my body. He kept trying to step closer and I kept backing up, too scared to even speak. What freaked me out more was that he hadn't pressed a separate elevator button, so he planned on getting off when I did. When I got to my floor, I almost ran to my room, and the guy just stood at the end of the hallway, waiting to see where I was going. I stayed in my room for 15 minutes until I was sure he was gone before I told my parents what had happened. They were freaked out and told the hotel staff, but there was no sign of the guy and it was really late, so I just locked my door and tried to get to sleep. I had almost drifted off when I heard a knock at my door. I obviously wouldn't just go and open the door at nearly 2am. Instead, I turned on a light and froze. At this point, my intuition had kicked in and I knew it was the guy. I was near tears, but the knocking kept continuing, harder and harder, so I finally shouted and asked who it was. The voice that replied to me was the most chilling thing I had ever heard. High-pitched but growl almost giggly, and so disturbing I could barely describe it. It's hotel staff, please let me in. I was terrified. A look through the people confirmed that it was the same creepy old guy. I locked myself in the bathroom and called my dad's phone. He has a habit of always keeping his ringer on, so he answered me almost immediately, and I tried to tell him what was wrong through my tears. The guy before, I managed, is at my door. And what happened next gives me nightmares. My dad naturally went into superhero mode and opened his door to find the old man in just a robe, whacking it. It's pretty obvious to piece together what he was planning. My dad slugged the dude in the face and made sure he didn't move an inch while my mom called hotel security. We pressed charges and the guy's in prison now.
Some backstory before I begin. These events started when I was in second or third grade, 2002 to 2003 ish, and ended during the fall of 2015. I'm a 21 year old female living in Canada. The RCMP are involved in the story, which stands for Royal Canadian Mounted Police. When I was in elementary school, I was friends with a girl named Jessica. We had a group of five or six girls that we always played with. Jessica's parents were divorced, and I often went over to her dad's house after school because they had a trampoline and a slide. Her dad was a totally normal normal dude. His name is Richard and he held a job as a pilot which is definitely a job that requires mental stability. Jessica came over to my house as well and her dad would always come pick her up after the play date so he was familiar with where I lived. And I think second or third grade, Jessica moved away to live with her mom. I didn't fully understand what was going on as a child and I still don't know what happened, but something had gone wrong with her father. We didn't hear much from Jessica, but around her birthday the following year, Richard invited our group of girls over for a surprise birthday party. We arrived at the party and we were waiting for Jessica so we could surprise her, but Jessica never showed up. We were just hanging out with her dad for a while. As a child, this didn't seem as weird as it does to me now. When our parents picked us up, we obviously told them what happened, and we didn't hang out with Jessica or Richard again. After that, some of the girls started receiving presents from Richard at their homes. I never received them, but my mother told me about it years later. The presents usually consisted of cheap jewelry and notes. I have no idea what the notes said, but I'm not sure if I want to. After this, Richard goes away. My mom later told me he he was in a mental institution. Years go by, I completely forget about the whole situation. Then, in the winter of 2013, I was out of town for a cheer competition. I was scrolling through Facebook one night when all of a sudden a new group chat popped up with five girls from my elementary school. I had not kept in touch with any of them, so this was weird. The chat was about how they had received messages from Richard on Facebook. I checked the other folder of my Facebook messages and sure enough, I had some too. I had a variety of messages that did not make a lot of sense, including some strange poems. Many of the messages were descriptions of dreams he had about me. Though some of them were nonsense, others were understandable enough to come across as violently threatening. I don't feel comfortable sharing some of the more explicit messages, but here are a couple of the shorter and less scary messages. Hi little girl from not long ago, pristine of pristineness, I want you, I want you, I want you. We're gonna have planets to go to someday provided you don't melt them first. I'm so proud of you, stay happy, and I haven't found a way to keep you all off my mind. I clicked on Richard's Facebook profile and his whole profile was dedicated to his five girls. He didn't have any friends added, so clearly nobody had seen it. Unfortunately, we didn't have very good security settings on Facebook. He had saved dozens of photos of us, and they reposted them with nonsensical and inappropriate captions. The captions ranged from essays about his love for us, to a one-sentence caption that simply said, She is so ugly. Here are some of the shorter photo captions. Emily, hopefully and not too soon, I'm gonna find out your address, and I'm gonna show up as a man that knocks on your front doorstep and bite your bottom lip off before you can say a word. Kiara, because of my initial euphoria, turns into sucking depression when I realize that there is nothing I can do about anything beside you because you're inside me and I can't get you out of my mind. I love you so much. Melissa, can I paint your picture? I want to lift you around to see how heavy you are and well go for a drive on Hollywood Drive with the windows rolled down so we can get a crystal clear view. We were all freshly 18 at the time and didn't know what to do, so our moms contacted the RCMP. They told us not to block Richard on Facebook, but not to reply as the messages could be used as evidence. He continued to send us messages every single day, and we shared the screenshots with each other in the group chat and sent them off to the RCMP. He had several different Facebook accounts that were all variations of his name along with one randomly named Esteban. One of the girls got in touch with Jessica to find out if she still had contact with her father. She only saw him on supervised visits every once in a while. She was very embarrassed and apologized a lot. She was a super sweet girl and obviously none of us were upset at her in any way. Eventually, Richard was charged with five counts of criminal harassment. He pled guilty and went to jail for around five months. When he got out, there was still a no contact order in place meaning that he could not contact any of us girls or come within a certain radius of our homes. He was not allowed to use the internet either. I'm not sure how all of this works, but this is what the constable handling the case told me. However, not surprisingly, he started contacting us on Facebook again. He went back to jail for breaching his probation. It was the summer of 2015 and he got out again. I started receiving more messages. I immediately wrote on the group chat to see if the other girls had gotten anything. They hadn't. It was just me. I immediately contacted the police. It seems they had forgotten to include my name on the no contact order. He knew not to contact the other girls, but thought it was still safe for him to contact me. 
This time things got worse. I had just started working at a new job, and being the idiot that I am, I had my workplace public on my Facebook profile. One day I came into work and there was a package waiting for me. I was obviously confused because I would never order something to be delivered to my work. I opened it up with my managers, and there was weed inside along with the disc with encryption software on it. He had mailed me weed to my work. I knew immediately that this was him, and awkwardly explained the situation to my managers who thought it was hilarious. The security in my office tower was alerted and given a photo of him. They began walking me to my bus stop after my shifts. It was scary knowing that he knew where I worked. At this point, I hadn't seen Richard in years, but it was clear that he was mentally unwell. I had absolutely no idea what he was capable of or what his motives were. The RCMP did not seem to take this case very seriously, and they moved very slowly, passing the case around to various officers. Meanwhile, I was terrified. I could hardly walk down my street at night without freaking out. Every time somebody knocked on my door while I was home alone, I would drop whatever I was doing and hide under the kitchen counters. I had not moved since I was a child, so it was very possible that he remembered where I lived. The packages kept coming. I received more weed in several different forms, including cookies, what appeared to be cocaine, and a key to his apartment along with some miscellaneous items. I opened all the packages at the police station. One of the packages included a USB stick with a bunch of audio recordings on them, but I decided it was better for me not to listen to them. The return of the packages was to a random PO box in another city that did not belong to Richard, and no fingerprints were found on the packages. During all of this, the Facebook message messages were made constant. Luckily, in one of the messages he informed me that he had sent me drugs and the key along with his home address. This confirmed that the packages were from him. He was charged again. I received a subpoena in the mail to appear as a witness in court. However, he once again pled guilty and I never got to go to court. I was actually a bit disappointed as I thought seeing him in person would provide me with some sort of closure. He is still locked up somewhere as I am writing this, but I still get scared walking at night or when somebody knocks on the door. The police provided me zero information on where he was being held or when he would be released. I feel like I am just waiting for the day that he will contact me again. I just hope that he never does. I had just moved out of a share house in the suburbs and into my own one bedroom apartment in the city. I am a male and at the time was around 25 years old. My apartment, while old and small, was located about 500 meters from one of the most popular night spots in the inner city. As I was in my mid-twenties and out on my own, this was the perfect place for me. This was because my friends and I were quite social and would frequent bars and nightclubs in the city and the taxi fares were starting to add up. Also, this new apartment was close to my work so it made sense. I got settled in right away and invited my friends over for pre-drinks before hitting the clubs. Due to the limited space in the apartment, this meant that some friends were inside and some were drinking on the walkway just out front. We had the music up and I just started drinking but between songs, I could hear the couple next door arguing. Now, the apartment was old and bad which meant thin walls too, so I pressed an ear to the wall in order to listen in. I hadn't met any of my new neighbors at this time as I didn't take long to move in and I didn't really see anyone during. I was curious. Judging from what I could determine while eavesdropping, they were a gay couple in their early 30s. One of the men was yelling at the other to go next door and tell us to keep it down. The other was arguing that it was just a housewarming and to let it go for the night. Since I didn't want to cause trouble, I marshaled everyone outside to start making our way to the nightclubs, leaving my new neighbors in peace. Later that night, I came home alone as I was tired from the move. I decided to let my friends carry on partying without me. I arrived at my door and proceeded to fumble around for my keys when I looked up to see a man standing in the walkway in front of the next apartment smoking a cigarette. He was tall and thin with brown oily hair. I noticed that he also had a cut lip and a faded but still visible black eye. I said, sorry about the noise earlier, correctly assuming he was my neighbor. He replied, nah, you're alright man, I'm Chris by the way. I shook his hand. I noticed his knuckles were red and a little bit scratched up so I knew something was off. I apologized for the noise and said, I hope I didn't cause any trouble for you. He withdrew his hand and with a soft but cracking voice said, nah, that's okay, Rick just gets a bit cranky sometimes, I'm used to it. With that, I finished off the conversation and told Chris that I'd see him later. It was about 2am at this point and I just wanted to sleep but couldn't help worrying about the potential domestic abuse going on next door. I decided to just keep an eye on it for now as I didn't have all the info, for all I knew, he could have gotten into a fight with someone else. As the weeks passed, I noticed that my new neighbors got drunk regularly and would argue almost every time. I could tell that Rick was the dominant one as his voice was a lot deeper and Chris seemed to be afraid of him during their shouting matches. This is why I kept my distance and never really socialized with them. I would even overhear them arguing about me and that Rick thought that Chris liked me, etc. I would just tune all of this out with headphones and video games, not to mention an active social life and full-time work to keep me occupied. I did find myself avoiding having guests over because of the neighbors. I would opt to meet people out as their arguments could be quite upsetting. This was working out fine enough for a while 
on till Christmas Eve that same year. I was arriving home after coming from last minute Christmas shopping. I was getting ready for a night of present wrapping as I was to visit my family the following day for Christmas. As I arrived home, I noticed two police cars outside and Anna, an Asian woman who lived a few apartments up from Chris was screaming. I asked her what was happening and all she said was, it's just so sad, while sobbing. I could see three officers trying to restrain somebody and there was blood on their uniforms. I came just a little bit closer to see Chris's oily brown hair in the center of the affray. His face was bleeding from his jaw where he had apparently been slashed by something sharp. They got him to his feet and I could see that his cheek had been cut so deep that the skin was flapping open as he struggled and resisted with the police. I recoiled in shock and went to comfort Anna who was crying uncontrollably at this point. Suddenly, Rick's voice boomed out from nowhere. You see what you've done, you loser. This frightened me and my instinct was to get myself and Anna to safety. Even though the cops were here, they had their hands full with Chris and I certainly didn't want to get involved in such an ugly fight where knives were involved. Anna refused to come with me and said that she would be fine. I looked around to see where Rick was as he kept yelling at Chris the whole time. The three cops struggled to restrain him. I could hear Chris whimpering apologetically in between. I couldn't see where Rick was so I decided just to go to my apartment and lock the door. As I turned to go, I froze in horror as Rick's voice boomed, where are you going? A deep chill went down my spine as my brain struggled to reconcile the fact that these words were coming out of Chris's mouth. I felt panic grip me as I realized that all this time Rick and Chris were the same person. All the fighting, laughing, drinking, and carry on that I couldn't help overhearing over the last couple of months had come from one solitary person. A lonely guy in his small one bedroom apartment. For some reason that made me feel sick. I learned later from Anna that this wasn't the first time the police had to come take Chris away. Anna explained that he spends a couple of months at the local psychiatric hospital each time. His father owns the apartment so it's here waiting for him when he gets out. I moved out a few months later and while it is a sad situation for Chris, I really do feel him. Today was like any other, just another ordinary day, working by myself in the store, checking out customers, stocking shelves and my moments away from the register. A normal day. At some point while on register, I greeted a man with a large dark beard, bald, and wearing glasses as he came through the door. He immediately smiled and got that surprised look on his face after seeing me as if he had just found his next victim. Eventually, after about an hour or two of being on register, I'd pretty much cleaned the store out of my customers and moved on to stocking candy. The man before before with a beard approaches me with a smile and holds up a large white trash can. Uh, excuse me, yes, I reply, glancing up from the box I'm stalking. Are there any more of these in the back? This one doesn't have a lid, he says, gesturing to the large trash can in hand. Oh yeah, I can check for you. I smile and turn away and head toward the stock room. I notice he's following me and think nothing of it, but glance down the aisles for any other customers as I walk, immediately taking note of the store's emptiness. Well, I guess it's just us in the store, I think to myself. Moving through the stock room door, I'm quickly relieved leave this guy stops at the entrance. I'll be right back I say as I make a turn around some full roll tainers, which due to just receiving a truck, our stock room is full of them. They stand very tall and are like giant movable walls, but very heavy mind you. Being short myself, I don't have to move them much to make a path through and see what's on them. So after only a minute, I've made myself a little path, having three heavy ones on my right and left and in front of me. I decide to give up my search for trash cans. Sign, I go to turn around and inform him of my defeat, only to find he's in my tiny path of walls. A very tight squeeze for a man of his stature, standing directly behind me. Find them? Uh, no. I don't think I have any. I try to laugh and avoid acknowledging the creepy situation. I'm in a very small area with walls at my back and sights towering over myself and this very robust man standing in the way of my only exit. In a room very far from any customers with no cameras and no other employees in the store. I'm helpless and increasingly growing scared at how this man isn't moving to let me out. I go to voice that I need to return to work after a solid minute goes by, but I am not able to get out a single word before he says in this creepy, almost shy voice, you're just the cutest little thing, did you know that? Within an instant, I'm scared and feel ill attention from the sky. Surprising myself though, I choke out without thinking. I just heard my bell, what? He looks confused but doesn't budge. I just heard my bell, there are people up front who need to be checked out and are looking for me. I stand nervously knowing full well neither of us heard the familiar ching from the service bell I keep on register. But what about my trash can, he asks, stepping forward but taking a glance back toward the trash can. And and again, with lightning thinking, I blurt out, I'll mark it down half price, no big deal, laughing and trying to act like nothing is out of the ordinary. I slip by him, seeing my opening at his turning around. I try my hardest to walk away, pretending to be calm as I exit the stock room, then sprint to the front of the store the moment I was out of sight. He wound up leaving without purchasing the trash can. So, creepy guy who I expect to pull something like that again, I hope you and I don't meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you.
My fiance and I threw a dinner party one time to celebrate his mom completing chemo. I hired a caterer. We were expecting 25 friends and family, so it was more than the kitchenette of our single story ranch house could handle. We'd also only just moved in, so didn't have a lot of cooking staples. The caterer said he'd bring everything 75% done, but he needed to finish off some dishes in our kitchen. I told him that was fine as long as he was finished by 5, because the kitchen is centrally located and we'd prefer everyone be finished before the guests arrive due to the intimate nature of the occasion. He said that would be fine. He arrives as scheduled at 12 p.m. We gave him until 5 and the guests aren't even arriving until 6, so it's plenty of time. He smelled bad. It was more than a sweat smell though. It smelled like a sunbaked diaper, and that made me uneasy because he was going to be preparing food for sick prior and young kids. I just made sure he washed his hands and then left him to his own devices worrying I was being presumptuous. Throughout the entire process, he keeps pulling me aside to ask me questions and have me taste things. I was super busy because my husband had to work during the day and pick up the surprise guest right after. So setting up the deck, decorating, putting together the slideshow equipment, coordinating the surprise guest, we flew in her sister and I had to make sure she got an Uber at the airport and her hotel had worked out etc and just a million other little details. So every 10 minutes being asked things like, do you prefer this with paprika or without? With this fine, whatever you think, tasted to be sure, was getting old. When he was still there at 545, after two gentle reminders, I flat out told him I needed him completely out by 6 no matter what. He apologized and said there had been a delay because our oven wouldn't stay up to temperature. I never had a problem with our oven but I figured he's the professional, maybe it was a subtle problem. A little before 6 rolls around, a few of our friends start trickling in. I decide to tell him whatever's done is done and whatever isn't he should just put in the fridge. But he's nowhere to be found. I go out on the deck to ask my friends if they'd seen him and he's out there. Alcoholic beverage in hand, out of his chef whites and now in a t-shirt and jeans, mingling with my friends. I walked out just in time for him to introduce himself to my cousin-in-law as a good friend of mine. Nope, too weird for me. I met him in person for the first time barely six hours ago. I told him he needed to leave, now. So he goes inside and gets his bag and makes a beeline for my bedroom. I'm taken aback. I say, excuse me, where are you going? And he says, to change. So first of all, we have a guest bathroom clearly visible. Second, why can't he wear a t-shirt and jeans home? I tell him I'm not comfortable with him going to my room, but he insisted to only be a second and goes in and shuts and locks the door. I couldn't even get a word out before he went in and I felt helpless. I was going outside to ask one of my friends to help me usher him out, but at that point my fiance got there with my aunt-in-law. I had to explain the situation to him nearly in tears at this point, and he was like, what? He went in the bedroom? Why? So he pounded on the door, and the caterer came out, still in a t-shirt and jeans, and my fiance said, you shouldn't be in there, you need to leave. And the caterer said, excuse me, but this is not your house, it is not up to you to decide. And my 6 foot 4, 260 pound fiance tells him, yes, actually, it is his house. It puts a hand on his back and guides him to the door. The caterer says, I thought she lived here, referencing me, and he says, yes, my fiance lives here with me and the caterer goes nuts. He turns to me and screams, you lied to me. I have no clue what he's talking about. He starts yelling about how I let him on and calling me more names. I don't know who he thought the man in the pictures with me around the house was. So my fiance says, oh no, you won't talk that way in my house. Find the door. And the caterer goes in the kitchen and starts throwing the trays of food out of the refrigerator and onto the floor. At that point, my fiance realized two of his brothers, both currently offensive linemen at the college level, had come in and were on the deck. He signaled to them and they came inside and he basically said, Said, this guy's harassing my fiance. They helped my fiance out. The party then went on as planned, but I insisted we just order pizza and throw out all the food he made. My fiance and friends kept saying, isn't that a bit much, but I was insistent. We went out late drinking with his brothers and got home around 3.30 a.m. and passed out in our room. At around 5 a.m., I was woken up to the sound of the door opening. I figure either we forgot to lock the door in our drunken stupor and it blew open or one of his family forgot their keys or something in the house and didn't want to wake us. His parents and his local brother have a key, but his parents never ever let themselves in when they know we're home. And his brother had even more than we did and was definitely not awake and driving around at 5 a.m. It wasn't nearly windy enough for the door to have blown open. It had been tranquil all night. So I wake up my fiance and whisper, someone just came in the house. And he said the same thing. Probably my brother left his wallet or something. I figure I'm being paranoid and try to put it to rest when I hear a loud crash sound. With that, my fiance was up and on his feet in one movement. He told me to lock myself in the closet and call 911 while he went and looked around. As I was pulling out my phone, we hear in the distinct accent, hello, and I realize it's just this insane caterer. I'm not worried about this caterer physically overpowering my fiance or me for that matter, so I charge right out there. The caterer is shirtless and clearly on something. He's taking the pictures that are of just me off the 
wall and holding several in his arms already. He lunges toward me when he sees me. My fiance gets between me and him and I call 911. My fiance tells him cops have been called and it is in his best interest to get off the property. The caterer says no, I have to make sure your fiance is okay. And I say what, why wouldn't I be okay? And my fiance rightfully says not to engage with him and feed into it. My fiance stays between me and him while I climb out a window. He watches as the caterer throws photos of us on the floor. My fiance didn't want to subdue or touch him in any way so the caterer couldn't make any assault claims. He's begun to destroy our kitchen at this point and when the cops come in he has a butcher knife. My fiance considered going for the gun safe when he first got the knife since we live in a standard ground state but he decided the situation was hectic enough without introducing a firearm. The caterer doesn't obey the police's orders to drop his weapon and he says he isn't leaving without me so they tase him. It's lucky for him he only got tased and he didn't antagonize my husband into squashing him. As he's let out in cuffs he's shouting how he and I are in love. He continues on this tirade the entire time police are reading him his rights. The police ask us to do an inventory of the house and see if anything's missing or damaged besides what we witnessed him do. We go around and there's nothing. But then I remember he was in our room yesterday and he went through the room. All of my underwear from the dirty laundry hamper were gone. We were so freaked out in the aftermath that we replaced all of our kitchenware, toothbrushes, sent our sheets to be professionally cleaned, and had a cleaning crew do a deep clean on the whole house. So glad we decided not to serve the food to our guest and my fiance's medically fragile mother. He sent me a letter from prison that thankfully my husband intercepted because I was still recovering from the whole thing. We gave it to the police who helped us get issued a no contact order. He was sentenced to three years in prison. This happened in May of 2015, in California which will help those of you who are familiar. I had graduated college in June of 2014, moved back into my old hometown, and started a consulting company with my boyfriend which is going very well. We had just finished a contract in the Bay Area, and were beginning a new one about 8 hours south in Torrance. He moved down there first to start setting up, while I took care of loose ends at our closing contract before moving down to meet him. The day comes and I pack my car and head down south to I-5, for the uninitiated it's a straight highway with little in the way of scenery aside from the occasional strip mall and its monotony has a reputation for putting drivers to sleep at the wheel. I pass a strip mall with gas and a fast food joint and decide to fill my car in my stomach. I go to park in the food venue's parking lot but it's completely full so I park across the street at a hotel which at the time I didn't think anything of. I go inside to eat my meal then cross the street to get back to my car. I'm well into the hotel parking lot when a pickup truck pulls down the aisle and cuts off my path and stops with a passenger side facing me. The driver is alone and a clean-cut white male in his mid-30s. I don't remember anything about him except that he looked very generic and buttoned up. The way he pulled in front of me to block my path didn't initially set off alarm bells. As he has done it pretty organically, he rolls down the window and the dialogue follows. Excuse me, miss, but could you please tell me where the grocery store in town is? I'm sorry, I'm not from here so I couldn't say. Oh, where are you from? Uh, good question, I don't know, not here though. I didn't say that to be rude, I had just moved through so many cities at that point and was on my way to a new one. I wasn't sure how to answer. He laughs and makes a joke, then asks me where I'm headed. I mentioned that I'm moving. I will say he was very charismatic and at this point I just think he's trying to flirt with me. And if I hadn't been so exhausted or in a relationship on another date it might have worked. He makes another comment about how unpleasant moving can be and then gives a warm chuckle and extends his hand to shake mine and goes, well I'm glad I got to meet you, I'm Scott. If you recall, the truck is in front of me with a passenger side facing me. I actually take a step forward to grab his hand and then got the delayed response of every alarm bell that should have gone off earlier. I'm in a hotel parking lot, he asked me a question that establishes I don't know where I am, another question that establishes I'm alone, and another question that establishes I'm not expected at my destination for many more hours. The thing that connected all these synapses when he extended his hand, he didn't make even the faintest effort to make it accessible to me. He didn't lean over the seat or move toward me in any way. His hand was hovering comfortably over the center console waiting for me to grasp it, which in order to do I would have to lean well into the car. Again, I had already taken a step toward him and begun to raise my hand to take his when the sirens went off. I rocked backwards back to where I was standing and I just remember looking in his eyes what felt like forever feeling everything click into place while also half convinced my imagination was just running wild. His hand still waiting, I lowered mine and felt my eyes slightly narrow with suspicion and slowly said, I'm going to walk away from your car now Scott. Boom. Truck burns rubber with thick gray smoke as the guy guns it out of the hotel lot at 100 miles per hour. He must have floored it. Regrettably smart on his end because I didn't have the license number or anything to offer the police. In the immediate minutes following the event, I felt relieved by 
but hadn't really processed the full weight of what happened. Unfortunately for me, I had many more hours to think back and analyze the whole interaction to shreds. The car was somewhat lifted, there could have easily been another person, or even two to three other people, hiding inside. I still get creeped out about thinking how close I came to taking his hand, and how fortunate I was that I didn't allow my reaction to be driven by manners as criminals often take advantage of. This happened when I was in high school long ago. My mom just recently found the paperwork about it when she cleaned out her office upon retiring from the police department. I remember being upset and scared when it happened, but reading the details as an adult, it sounded even worse than I remembered. I was a 17 year old female, working at a flower and gift shop. It's nighttime. a man comes in, short, overweight, balding, and 40 years old. He tells me about how he needs an apology gift for his girlfriend. So I offer a bouquet, obviously it's a flower shop. He says she doesn't like flowers because they die. This is the first weird thing as he came into a flower shop. Then he goes into detail about how he hit her and asked me if I think it was the right thing to do so. This was long ago so I don't remember exactly what I said but it was something along the lines of not if you want her to continue being your girlfriend. He then tells me what a great job I'm doing and asks me when I get off work. I dodge answering and he leaves. Nothing for six months. Then right before Valentine's Day he walks in the door one minute before close. It was dark and from the outset it looked like I was working alone as my co-worker about a 40 year old female was in the bathroom. Instinctively, it felt like a predator had just entered the room. You know when something isn't right and everything felt not right. I then noticed he has a tarnished revolver tucked into the front of his windbreaker, which is halfway unzipped. It was obvious he wanted it seen. I quickly scribbled a note to my co-worker that said he has a gun and handed it to her when she came out of the bathroom. She calmly walked to the phone and looked at me, wordlessly asking if she could call the cops. I shook my head no as I felt like it would escalate the situation. God forbid he heard the police coming and took us hostage or something. I was just going to try and act as calm and normal as I could and hopefully not tip the situation to something more dangerous. He spends 15 minutes wandering around what was a fairly small shop. In retrospect, he was probably waiting to see if my coworker would leave as it was now well past closing. Finally, he places an order for pickup on Valentine's Day, which gives me his name and info, which I'm going to for sure file with the police report. He buys a card and pulls out a wad of $100 bills, which he slowly thumbs through as though looking for the right one with which to pay for his $40 order. I ask him if he wants a bag as it wouldn't be very inconspicuous if he just showed up at home with the valentine's card. He replies, no, I didn't feel like being inconspicuous tonight, which seemed like an obvious reference to the gun hanging out of his coat. He leaves. We quickly lock the door and watch him sit in his truck outside. We were not about to exit the shop until he was gone. Finally, he pulls out of his parking spot and moves to another spot further away and continues to just sit there. I don't know how long we waited, but he finally left. I called my mom crying. She called the police who came to the shop the next day to take a report. I told my best friend at the time what happened. She told her mother. Her mother happened to work with the man and informed security at her job. She said he was very weird, creepy, and liked to talk about weapons a lot. Security at his job, it's a large company with government contracts and things having to do with tech and security, pulled him into the office and questioned him about it. He claimed it was a glove in his pocket, not a revolver. The police were pissed that this company made contact with him about it before they did, and he successfully dodged the cops multiple calls and visits to his apartment. My mom, much to my teen fury at the time made me quit my job, which was devastating as I loved it there. In retrospect, totally the right call. I never saw him again. In my late teens and early 20s, I was friends with a girl named Lucy. She was a very lonely kind of girl whose parents were, well honestly, not really great parents. Her mother was verbally abusive and her father really couldn't care less about anything. Because of the lack of love in her life, Lucy searched through dating sites for love and comfort from strange men and she was not afraid of meeting them face to face even if they'd been chatting for only a few days. My friendship with Lucy was a strange one. I found her quite annoying sometimes but I also felt awful for her because of her loneliness and lack of friends and love in her life. Sometimes I really didn't want to hang out with her and some days I would accept her offer to hang out. When it was just her and I together she was normal and okay to be around but also very appreciative of having someone giving her attention. We had a small group of friends and she would try to get all of us together as often as possible and honestly the whole group together was really quite fun. When we were all together Lucy was very hyper and you could just tell that she was happy to be around people who didn't insult her as her mother does. Suddenly Lucy tells us she has a boyfriend. We were all surprised 
surprised because we knew she met a lot of guys online, but we had never heard her say she was dating someone. A few days later, she sets up a day for our friend group to meet Trevor. None of us were looking forward to it because we thought he was going to be like all the others, a temporary boy toy. When we met him, we all felt awkward. He barely spoke a word. He wouldn't look directly at any of us at all. Lucy would try to be funny, but he would just give her dirty looks. Needless to say, we thought he was a weird one and could tell he didn't care much for her. As the days went on, Lucy kept telling me how much Trevor did not like me. She kept saying he thinks I am using Lucy for her money. Not sure how he thought that since I paid for everything for Lucy. To keep this piece of the story short, I think he was trying to find reasons to convince her to get rid of me. I got a terrible vibe from Trevor. He dressed like he didn't care about life, he never smiled, he didn't shake our hands when first meeting us, he stank of weed and really had an overall uncomfortable feeling about him. After months of Trevor trying to convince Lucy that I'm a terrible friend and she should not hang out with me anymore, she started to do as he said. She would start to hide me from him. If she and I were together and he would call her on her phone, she would lie and say I wasn't there. If she was with the group of friends, he would have her swear I wasn't there. When he was going to be joining the group on an outing or just hanging out at her place, she would tell me I couldn't come. Lucy will do whatever a boyfriend says just to keep pleasing him so she doesn't lose them. Now here's where it gets scary. Lucy calls me one day and says she wants me to come hang out at her place. I agreed. She came to pick me up and we went to her house and watched TV for a bit. We then decided since the day is nice outside, we would take her two dogs for a walk to a nearby pocket park and would later return to the house to have lunch together. While at this park, she receives a phone call. Now let me say that Lucy is not a private person whatsoever and has never ever walked away to answer a phone call until this day. She walked far enough away that she knew I would not be able to hear anything she said. This was suspicious to me but not enough to question it. The call ends as she begins walking towards me with a look on her face as if she is trying not to smile. She tells me, so I need to bring you home now. I was slightly confused as we had only been together for about an hour when we usually spend the entire day together and she would never want me to go home. She would even frequently beg me to sleep over to avoid being alone. So anyway, I said okay and we walked to drop off her dogs at home and we got into her car and off we went. About 10 minutes into the car ride, I realized she isn't going in the direction of my house, so I question it. Where are we going? She smirked, but didn't respond. I asked again, laughing uncomfortably. Seriously, where are we going? She continued to smirk, but didn't want to answer me. I started to realize she was heading in the direction of where her boyfriend lived. I asked one last time with anger in my voice, where are you taking me? Her only response was bone chilling to me. Trevor wants to talk to you. I wasn't having any of this. I insisted and demanded she let me out of the car, but with her evil smirk and same response, she said it again. It's okay. He just wants to talk to you. I was furious at this point because this creepy guy who looks like he wants to kill someone who also despised me wanted to talk to me. Why can't he talk to me on the phone? Why do I need to go to his sketchy apartment? She absolutely refused to let me out of the car. She had the doors locked as if I wasn't able to unlock my passenger door. I waited until she reached a red light. I grabbed her wallet from the back seat and took out her bus pass and bolted out of the car. I had no idea where I was or where the nearest bus stop was, but I was not about to let her crazy boyfriend do whatever he wanted to me. She yelled for me to get back into the car, but of course I ignored her. She sped off furiously. I immediately blocked her number on my phone. I removed her as my friend on social media and immediately warned the group of friends not to talk to her because she has gone nuts. I have not spoken to her since that very day and she also lost the other five friends of the group as well. I've recently moved into a new apartment three weeks and I'm starting to share it with my sister. The only reason we know properly is a single mom who lives in the apartment next to us. Ever since we moved in, she's been giving us advice and helping us out with things, etc. We don't know any of the other neighbors properly yet. Today I was out with my friends and after that I went to get my sister so we could go out for some food. We got home around 10pm. My sister and I got into our PJs and were sitting around watching TV when our buzzer rang. I jumped up to answer it and it turned out to be our neighbor single mom. I asked her what was up and she said that our dad is asking for us downstairs. Straight away my stomach dropped. I immediately asked her if she's sure he said that he was our dad. The reason I asked this was just to make sure that is what she actually said. But she replied that yeah, he said he was our dad and he was asking for us. The neighbor then asked me if she could let him up to our flat, but I told her no. I wanted to shout out to my sister, but I didn't want to worry her right away. So I asked the neighbor to not let him come up yet, and I heard her repeat this to him. I couldn't hear anything for a few minutes and I started to get really worried. At this point, my sister comes up to me and asks who it is. I called out to my neighbor a few times, but she didn't answer. It must have only been about a minute, but it honestly felt like ages when she didn't reply. I was about to tell my sister to call 911 because I was starting to panic and I didn't know what was happening out there. But then she came back on and told me that he was gone. She then came up to our flat and explained what went down. 
She said that she was walking back to her flat after finishing work and she saw a man by the buzzers. At first, she assumed that he was just someone who lived there, but when he noticed her walking up, he asked us by name and asked us if she could let him up to our flat. She asked him who he was and he told her that he was our dad. Obviously, she buzzed us and told us first, since our neighbor doesn't know us that well, so she doesn't know what our dad looks like. She said that because we were young and on our own and she didn't want to buzz an estranged man up to our flat. She said that her mom and instincts kicked in when she heard me being hesitant to let him up to the flat. She said that apparently after he heard me say that he got really pushy with her and started trying to move her out the way. He kept on saying to her, it's okay, I'm their dad, let me in, I'm not going to do anything. She started arguing with him and told him that if I don't feel comfortable letting him in, there's no way he's getting in. He then got into the car and rode away. Now this is the reason why I hesitated. We haven't spoke to our dad since I was 16. We even considered getting a restraining order from him at one point. He's not even our biological father but we were legally adopted by him when I was nine. He was very abusive. It got to the point where we, me, sister, and my mom had to leave him in the middle of the night. He was always really controlling and after we left, he would secretly follow us around and leave threatening voicemails on the phone. I found out that he has a criminal record as well as I believe he was convicted of manslaughter in the 80s. I have no idea of the backstory behind that and I honestly don't really want to know. Like I said, we haven't from him since I was 16, which was three years ago. And as soon as she said the word dad, I almost had a panic attack. I asked her to describe him, and she said that because it was dark out, she couldn't really see him. We ended up staying with her because me and my sister are really shaken up. This happened a long time ago, when I was around 15 or so. I'm 25 now. Back then, I was really into singing and dancing with my friends, and I was introduced to K-pop as a result. This was way before K-pop became noticeably mainstream, so whenever events relating to it came up, we got very excited. There was a global audition for one of the big companies in my town, and my three friends and I decided to go. I was the only non-Asian girl in our friend group. I'm only mentioning it because this pertains to the story later. The K-pop fandom back then was pretty much the same as now. People of various ethnicities were into the idol music genre. We all knew the likelihood of getting into the industry was super low, and for me even more so, as I wasn't of Asian descent. But I knew that going in. That wasn't the point of us going though, we just loved being in proximity of something important to the genre we enjoyed. Just kids having fun. By the way, I looked pretty young for my age then, and wearing pigtails this day didn't help with that either. So we get dropped off and meet up at the audition place, a community center of some sort. We kind of dilly dally around a bit until we have to line up for our respective auditions, i.e. singing, dancing, etc. I was going to go sing, so I was mentally preparing myself in the crowded space outside of the audition rooms. That's when out of the corner of my eye I see a tall, older, maybe 40 years old, white man beginning to approach me. I remember thinking, huh, is he going to audition too? It was strange because everyone else in there was younger, maybe he was a parent. He walks up pretty close and goes, can you help me please? I'm confused and I ask him what he needs help with. Oh, the staff here, my son. My son's trying to audition, but they won't let him audition. Okay, this was weird. I then asked him why. He said, because he's not Korean. That was when I started to get creeped out. I looked around to see a pretty diverse crowd and then back at him. Uh, I don't know. That's terrible. You should talk to, and then I point towards the staff. They should be able to help. I knew he was lying, but I was too scared to say anything else. I went on, anyone could audition here. He didn't listen and insisted on me helping him. Then he said something that sent a chill down my spine. When I was trying for the fifth time to convince him to approach the staff instead of me, he beckoned me to come outside with him. My son's just outside in my car. Can you come talk to him, please? That was when I repeated what I said earlier and began to firmly walk in the opposite direction. He kept trying to coax me out to see his son. I managed to lose him in the crowd of people. Only seconds later, I see him talking to my friend about me and helping his son and all that. I was shocked. The man had clearly been watching me for a while to know who I came with. We were split up at that point. I went up and told her we should get going without looking at the man. He ignored me and kept on talking to her. Without speaking, I went up to her, grabbed her hand, and pulled her at once to get her away from him. She was super gullible and didn't understand why I was so worried. That man clearly was unnerved by what I did and left my friend and then disappeared into the crowd. So about 20 minutes later, I'm in the lineup for the audition when I get a cold feeling in my body, and I turn to look towards the entrance. My audition room was close to it and there he was, standing. But he wasn't just standing, he had his arms crossed and he was glaring at me. I've never seen someone look at me with such vitriol. He looked like he wanted to kill me, it was terrifying. The crowd of people was sparse because we all had lined 
up outside of our assigned rooms. This man waited there, staring at me nonstop for an hour. An hour. He glared at me all the way until I got into the audition room. I was so scared that he'd be there once I got out, but I guess the auditions went on longer than he expected and he went home. With his son in tow, I'm guessing. I was so scared that he'd be there once I got out, but I guess the auditions went on longer than he expected and he went home. With his son in tow, I'm guessing. I've worked a few odd jobs in my life. My first job was a summer job at 16 during summer break at a dairy farm. I absolutely hated it there and made it harder for me to find the motivation to even try finding work again when the time came. I don't really remember how I was first referred to the job, but the following summer, I ended up working as an office assistant for a self-employed photographer. My parents knew her because she used to be a member of their church, and my sister attended her 4-H program when she had it. By that time, her health had begun to take a hit as she claimed it was a mixture of things from chronic Lyme to fibromyalgia. I had I had also been warned by my parents that she was a little off. She was very religious and claimed to have had real encounters with demons, even participated in a few exorcisms. I'm an atheist and a skeptic, so I never took her story seriously. Aside from the weird things she would tell me, she was mostly harmless and working for her was not hard. The job basically required me to do a lot of data entry, as well as help prep her photos with some minor touching up and the addition of her company watermark before uploading them to a site where her customers could browse them and then pick which ones they wanted to order. She primarily photographed horse events, dressage, stadium, and cross-country jumping, etc. And for the first several months, my job stayed in her living room, which is basically my office space at the time. Eventually, I was talking to tagging along at shows where she trained me as a photographer, and soon I was shooting at the events along with her. It was boring work, I won't lie. I'm not a horse person. But things didn't get weird until a year later when I learned the hard way it was not her that I needed to worry about. She had two sons, one who was out of state, the other one was in the Navy. The latter of the two, a guy called Nate, I had only heard small things about. When he finally returned home and I met him for the first time while working in her living room, he seemed like a nice guy, a little odd but not concerning. He was obsessed with movies, and being a bit of a movie buff myself, whenever he would venture to the living room to strike up a conversation, it would always be about whatever movies we were into or were excited to see. I should point out here that I was 18 by this point and he was in his mid-30s. At some point, he got it in his head that I was interested in him, though he never said anything directly to me. I had to find out about it from my parents. My mom worked as the secretary at her church in Nate knew it. I could only guess my boss had told him. One afternoon, Nate showed up at my mom's desk and started gushing about me. He talked about how much fun I was, how he loved talking to me, how he was planning to take me to the movies and take me to this church and all these other plans he had for me. My mom was beyond uncomfortable, as was the pastor who happened to overhear it. And when I got home that night, she told me what had happened and suggested I make sure not to lead him on. I was completely baffled because I hadn't done anything. We never even discussed the possibility of doing anything together. I made an effort to acknowledge him less when he was around and keep the conversation short while stressing I had work to do. Eventually, he got his own place and moved out of his parents' house, so I figured the problem had solved itself. A couple years later, I had moved out, my boss's company had closed, and I was working someplace new. I was friends with both my boss and Nate on Facebook, and around that time I was finally coming out as an atheist, something I couldn't do when I was still living at home. One night, my old boss messaged me, asking about a ring I had on my finger. It was a black ring with a white solid star in the middle of a black circle. Already knowing where she was going with this, I told her it was just a ring. She started accusing me of wearing a pentagram, because she didn't know what a pinnacle was, and that I was promoting Satan. I tried several times to explain to her that not only was it not that symbol, but that also paganism has nothing to do with Satan anyways, but she refused to listen so I just ignored her. It was typical behavior of her and not worth the argument. The next morning, I had a message from Nate, telling me I needed to come to his church with him. I told him no and the messages I received back gradually grew angrier and angrier. He went from asking to demanding I go with him. He told me I was lost and that I would not find the answers I needed by living the life I was. Eventually, he outright said he thought the fact that I was wearing a pentagram was disgusting and that I was opening myself up for possession. Knowing there would be even less of a point in arguing with him than there was with his mother, I went ahead and blocked both him and her, deciding I was done with the both of them. Then, he started showing up at my workplace. He would always search through the store until he found me, and then once he did, he would corner me and not stop talking to me no matter how many times I tried to dodge him or tell him I needed to get back to work. Eventually, the managers caught on and started intercepting him whenever he showed up. I wasn't making enough to pay the rent with that job, so I had to take up a second one. Within a week of working my second job, which was in a different town, he showed up there too. This time I told the managers outright who he was, and after that, every time he showed up, I was allowed to hide in the back room behind a locked door while they sped his order along and got him out. One of those mini encounters, while I was hiding in the back, one of the managers was back there with me, inputting employee time punches into the computer when the both of us heard Nate shout in our directing, I know you remember me. That was the last straw for them and they told him his business was no longer welcome 
from there. He started showing up at my other job as well for a while, which was a relief. Fast forward to a few years later, I was getting used to not having to look over my shoulder every shift or checking the parking lot for his truck. Then one day he reappeared. He was browsing a section I was walking past when he spotted me and got this deer in the headlights look. I made a beeline to the break room because just seeing him made me scared. After that, he started showing up regularly. I would always find ways to dodge and avoid him, but he would still eventually spot me and know I was still there. I was debating whether or not to tell the managers because at this point it had been a while since he had done anything and saying something just because I was nervous didn't feel right. Call me a coward or an idiot but that was my thought process. What happened next made me regret not speaking up. It was bound to happen eventually, but one night he managed to catch me while I was at the customer service desk. He approached me and said hi, and I immediately started to look for someone to signal over so I could make a break for it. But before I could say a word, he said something that made me feel sick. How's your little girl doing? She's three now, right? I look at him horrified. I had him completely blocked from all of my social media, I had his number blocked, I was living at a new address, and I had not seen or spoken to his mother since she confronted me about my ring. I had not told either of them I was a parent now or that I was married, and I was not friends with any one who knew them, but he knew. How's your husband doing too? He asked when I didn't answer. He's good, he's a good man, I said, trying to reinforce the idea that I was not available to him and that I had no desire to have anything to do with him. Where does he work? At this point, I felt like I was going to pass out. Thankfully, another employee approached just to gather some reshelves, and I got out of there. As I was leaving, he called out behind me, I'll see you again, we'll talk, we'll go out and do something together, we will. I reported him to the managers, telling them everything about the encounter, including all the information he had on me and my family that he should not have had. They were able to pull up his face on CCTV. I haven't seen him since the incident with my managers. I think he may have gotten scared off. Turned out one of my co-workers used to work with them too at a different job and she also made a complaint about him to the managers. I don't know what they did with that information afterwards, but I know he hasn't shown up since. It sounds like they plan to call the cops if he sets foot in the store again. With two employee complaints of stalker-like behavior, they refuse to ignore that. When I was about 7 years old, my father bought a few hundred acres in southern Mississippi about 1.5 hours west of Mobile, Alabama. He built a small cabin on top of a hill that was in the middle of a large field surrounded by woods. This house was about 5 miles from a paved road. To get to our land, it took nearly 10 minutes of driving down dirt roads from the main highway, which was south of the house. About a quarter mile north from the house, he built a small lake, more like a pond. It was about as long as a football field but wider. To get to the lake from the house, you could take Route A which was a hard packed dirt road that was lined with dogwood trees. It was beautiful in the spring. Route B was about 100 yards east of Dogwood Lane and we named it Vampire Trail because it was always so gloomy. The trees blocked out the sun on the brightest days and it had a slight decline as you walked toward the lake. I say walked because this trail was not for vehicles. Thick woods filled the area outside and in between both trails. One morning during the fall, my parents and my little sister had gone to get ice cream and do some shopping. This trip would take them at least an hour or two. I was 10 years old so I decided decided to go fishing while listening to Bama play Ole Miss. The game was the usual Bama win so I thought I could ease the boredom of a blowout by fishing in the well-stocked lake, so I carried my pole, small radio, and my small ice chest. I had an Airedale Terrier named Bull that never left my side and it was on this day I realized how awesome he really was. Onto the lake we went. Picture a large oval roughly the size of a football field but larger with an L-shaped pier in the southeast corner. Vampire Lane opened up to a more severe decline to the shore and then the small pier. Across the lake on the west west side there was a narrow tree line that separated the shore from Dogwood Lane. The north side of the lake was the dam and the south end in thick and swampy woods. Fortunately for me, I realized later. About five minutes after I threw out my line and two Bama touchdowns later, I got that feeling. It's a feeling I have come to recognize well and it may have saved my life this day. The feeling of being watched by something dangerous. Bull must have felt it too because a few seconds later I could hear him growling low and staring across the lake to the west. To the tree line that separated Dogwood Lane from the lake. I turned my head in that direction and almost Almost immediately my eyes lit on what I thought to be half of a silhouette of a large man behind a tree. It was too far to make out details but close enough to be sure of what I was seeing. Almost 5 minutes went by and right before I scolded myself for an overactive imagination, the half silhouette moved behind a tree slowly. Bull stood and growled louder and I told him quietly to stop and I turned my head north towards the dam while keeping my eyes and attention rooted to that tree. Over the next 10 minutes, which felt like hours, I watched while this figure moved slowly from tree to tree, always north and always facing me. The saying, scared stiff, was something I found to be true. For some reason, I thought it was important that whoever or whatever it was did not know I was aware. 
I finally realized that the figure's path was bringing it closer to the dam, which would make its path to be shorter and easier. My paralysis broke and I casually put down the fishing pole and started walking towards Vampire Lane. As an adult, I was in the army for 11 years as an MP, but not turning to look over my shoulder during that walk was the hardest thing I have ever done. In my mind's eye, whatever it was, was screaming across the dam towards me. When I hit the tree line, I broke into a run. As I was running, Bull dashed ahead of me and my anger turned into admiration as he stopped some 20 yards ahead and faced north until I passed him. He continued this action the entire run home. My dog was watching my back, just epic. Although I can grasp the awesomeness of this now, at the time I was so scared that I was literally sick. Even at such a young age, I knew that a large man watching and trying to creep up on a 10 year old boy was up to no good. When I reached the cabin, I immediately locked the door and got one of my dad's shotguns as well as his 38 revolver. I sat at the large front window, my eyes glued to both trail openings in the woods between them. My family returned shortly after and for some reason I did not mention what happened. I never felt safe there again. When me and my friends or my little sister wanted to go anywhere other than the area around the cabin, I made sure my parents were with us. What scares me the most though is the fact that our closest neighbors were about two miles northwest of us, with thick woods in between as the crow flies. Who or what was watching me from the woods that day, guess I may never know. I sometimes wish I could go back then. As a grown man with military training, as I am now, Bull lived a full life and was put to sleep peacefully as a very old but great dog. The best dog I have ever known. This happened a few years ago, and since then it has made me look at people very differently. I used to work in a strip mall out in a fairly rural area. Most people are recognizable even if you don't know them personally. People from out of the area frequently stop on their way through to other towns, so it's not like there are never out of towners, just that they might be easy to spot. Like in many places, we have a few homeless folks that hang around the shopping center, and they occasionally ask people for change or food. It could be a nuisance, but the folks that worked at the shops kind of kept an eye on them to help them out or to keep track of how they are doing. There's this one guy, let's call him Shane, that over the course of years has slowly gotten in worse and worse shape. He would be filthy and was clearly not doing well mentally, and was usually intoxicated. He always had several layers of clothing and the pants that he wore on the outside of his other pants always sacked making it hard for him to walk. He'd go missing for days and then show up again. We'd wonder what happened to Shane and ask around a bit, and a few days later he'd appear again. He was always so dirty. I always wished there was a way we could get him some help, but I didn't really know what to do. One day, I was out in a major city that is about 80 or so miles away from where I work. I happened to see a well-dressed, very well-groomed gentleman that looked exactly like Shane, but at that moment I figured my eyes were deceiving me. This guy has an expensive looking shoulder bag, a new iPhone, and an Apple Watch. We were both in line at a popular food truck and it was usually a long wait to order and get your food. Most people just mind their business and scroll on their phones while waiting. This guy on the other hand is staring daggers at me. I keep avoiding looking that way, but I keep glancing to see if he's still there. And at the time, Time, I want to look at him because I'm so curious about how much he looks like Shane. I glance his way and I have to stumble back because he's practically right up against me. He has such intense eyes, he sort of whispers to me, but really intensely, and tells me he knows where I'm from and what shop I work at. He gets closer and I can tell he smells good, and I can even smell his minty breath. I ask how he knows and he just smiles. I ask again and he smiles brighter, exposing a perfectly clean set of teeth, minus one tooth. I'm almost positive Shane is missing that tooth. I edge away, feeling more than a little uncomfortable. His his order gets called up but they say his name is James. The next few days I don't see Shane anywhere around the shopping center and I ask around and no one had seen him for a few days. Someone says they hope he's okay, another person shrugs and says they wish they could do something to help him. The next day he is here, filthy as ever, grimy teeth, dirty fingernails, and wearing all his layers. He sits on the curb outside my shop and asks people for change. I decide to venture out and confront him. I'm 100% sure it's him, but I don't understand how he could get so filthy and smelly in such a short time. I ask him if he was in the city and he looks looks at me through bloodshot eyes and mumbles that he'll kill me if I tell anyone. This takes me aback and I look at him puzzled. He slurs again that he will kill me if I tell anyone that he's not actually homeless. He starts to get worked up but I ended up calling the police because I didn't know at that point what he was capable of. He wandered off and I haven't seen him since. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This story takes place late around 1.30 a.m. when I get the call. A very drunk friend of mine, Claire, is begging me to come pick her up and give her a ride home soon. The bar is closing soon and she's too drunk to drive home. The bar she is at isn't too far from my house, about a 10-15 to 15 minute drive, but the issue is that she lives like 35-45 to 45 minutes on the other side of town. Claire has been extremely nice to me in the past and I did owe her a solid so at about 10-2, to 2, I grab my keys and my concealed carry and leave the house. I get to the bar at around 5 past 2 
too, and she's sitting outside on a bench by the doorman. I pull into the parking lot, which is pretty empty since the bar is closed, and I assume the cars remaining were the workers who had yet to leave. I get out of the car and start walking to Claire, who is kind of slumped over. I was hoping she wasn't passed out drunk, and when I got to her, the doorman asked me if I was her ride. I told her yes, showed my ID for proof, and what he said next was of some concern. He kind of pulls me in and says, Hey, I was supposed to leave when we closed, but I have a strong feeling your friend was roofied. She's been on the porch drinking all night and some guy kept hovering around her. I assumed it was a boyfriend or whatever, but she never turned to talk to the guy. She was either drinking or chatting with other girls around her. Well, anyways, she chugged her last drink, came up to me and told me you would be coming to pick her up, and she asked me if she could sit by me, and she told me she felt very dizzy and sick. I told her sure, hoping she just drank too much and she passed out right after she sat down. After that, I couldn't see the guy anymore, but I didn't want to take any chances. So visibly concerned, I thanked the guy profusely, and he even helps me carry Claire to my car. Midway to carrying her, she's kind of coming to, like someone just waking up after a surgery. That really groggy, not knowing where they are, talking of nonsense kind of talking. I don't remember exactly what she was talking about, but I'm sure if I wasn't on high alert about her possibly being drugged, it was some funny stuff. So we get her buckled in, I think the guy again, and he just says he hopes she gets home safe. So now, hoping my friend is only stupid drunk and not drugged, I start driving to her house. The whole time I'm trying to keep an eye on her, and an eye on the road. She's now snoring asleep, which puts me at ease a bit, but about halfway to her house, my fuel light comes on. Cursing the fuel economy of a sports car, I pull into the next gas station. It's one of those small gas stations that doesn't have 24 hour store, so I'm on extra high alert while I start to pump gas. The gas station is about a block from the freeway, and right at the corner of the intersection. The street itself is pretty dark, with lonely lampposts shining very pitiful lights at large intervals. I get that really dead feeling like this place is just abandoned. To give an idea of positioning, because this is important, the gas station is at the corner of the intersection. The storefront would be facing south, and we were right in front of it where the pumps were. The east would be where there are air pumps for tires and parking spaces, and the north would be a diesel fuel pump right behind the store accessible from the street behind the gas station. I drive a Corvette so the filler is on the rear end of the car, and I'm leaning against the rear looking around. To my left, I hear this weird metallic scraping sound, so I turn and see this guy, about 15 to 20 feet from me, come around the corner dragging a long metal pipe on the ground. I immediately sense that I'm in a possibly dangerous situation now. The guy looks almost possessed but he's not looking at me, rather like he's trying to look into my car. I'm on the defensive, but hope I can get him to leave so I call out, hey, everything alright? Without looking at me, he answers back, you took my girlfriend from me, I'm here to take her back. Now he turns to look at me and he's got blood in his eyes. Before he begins to take a step though, I start yelling, hoping it'll get him to back off. Back off, please turn around. He takes a step towards me, clearly unimpressed. So almost automatically, I pull my handgun from my inside the waistband holster and draw a bead on him. Back off, you don't have to die, I start yelling louder. Anyway, in a panic, the guy throws the pipe at me. It whizzes by and I dive behind my car for cover. I have no idea if he has a gun himself or what, but I was going to put some kind of cover between me and him. And by the time I kneel up and aim over the rear of my car, he spooked it. I hear a car door slam and tire screech, and he launches off the curb on the east side of the lot and is tearing down the road, swaying all over the place. In my own panicked hurry, I pull the pump out of the car, screw the cap on, and tear out of there myself. Claire, however, is still passed out in the car, and now I'm afraid because I'm convinced she'd been drugged and we were followed by that guy. Me being more concerned about her earlier and keeping on the road, I must have not noticed being followed. The whole way back to her house, I'm wary of any car that's behind me. I'm also driving very aggressively, and when I get to Claire's neighborhood, I circle a separate block that's not hers four times to make sure no one followed me. When I was satisfied thinking I wasn't being followed anymore, I pull up to her house and try to shake her awake. She's doing that groggy waking up stuff from before, but now she's able to get up. I'm able to walk her. Thankfully, I was worried I was going to have to call an ambulance if she didn't wake up, and I get her keys from her bag. I manage to walk her inside, and this point she's kind of coming around, asking me what's going on, where she is, etc. I tell her she's home and get her to lie down. She's completely lost looking, and her eyes start welling up. She clings to me and starts sobbing. She's still very out of it, but I'm guessing she realizes something bad was going on or attempted on her. I was able to get her to lie down and get her to sleep. I write a note for her which pretty much said, hey, I'll be in the 
next room, we're going to the hospital in the morning to get you checked out. Fast forward to the morning, she's sick as a dog, and after she expelled some demons from her stomach, I drove her to the hospital where she got tested and treated. I still shudder to think what might have happened had I not had my CCW with me. Claire still doesn't remember much from the night except calling me and wanting to sit next to the doorman. They did a urine test at the hospital and found traces of Rohypnol, roofies. In the days after we went to the bar and let them know what happened, I gave as good description I could of the guy. Claire decided against filing a police report and I respectfully went with her wishes. My advice is, either be with friends you trust when you go out or at least be vigilant if you're by yourself. That night could have ended badly in a thousand different ways but thankfully everyone made it out safe. I don't really know where to begin, but I suppose it started before I was born. My birth set in motion a series of actions that led to the threat on my life beyond my control. So pre my existence, my mother, Jane, dated an older guy named James when she was in her mid-teens. He adored her, but wasn't of the same religion as her, so she ended up marrying a gentleman from her congregation instead, leaving James' brother put out. A year after being married, Jane gave birth to me and decided that she was unhappy with my father, Dave, and contacted James with the intent to go back to him. So Jane packed a bag one night, took me and left. As soon as she arrived at James, she was bombarded with messages from Dave telling her that he would take full custody of me if she didn't return. So with a heavy heart, she chose me over James, and therein lies my problem. She went back to my father and after another year of failed attempts, they divorced and my mother moved south to be with family, completely forgetting about James. My childhood was fairly normal for the next 13 years. A few house moves, a new stepdad, and a few siblings. Mother's second marriage falls through and she's single again. The year is 20 10 and she has just discovered Facebook. Being newly single and having sudden contact with all of her old school friends, she quickly strikes up a few romances out of nostalgia. Nothing sticks though until she finds him. James has a Facebook account. Not very active, no profile picture, but my mom is sure it is him and immediately falls in love again. He comes down south and meets his kids and stays for my 16th birthday party. Looks wise, he is easily in his 50s with shaved gray hair and glasses. My mom leaves him a third time and he finally flips and the crazy comes out to play. He starts turning up at the house uninvited. He is told to leave every time. The visits become less frequent and we think maybe he's got the message. But then hand-delivered letters start arriving for my mom. And it's the contents of these letters that cause me alarm. In them he details how if she had never met my father, they could have been happy together. And he had a plan to get her back that was ruined by the untimely arrival of me. So he did what any crazy man would do and started plotting to get me out of the picture. Back in 1995, she had a near miss of a car accident with baby me in the car when a car clipped her at a junction. She didn't get the car's details but put it down to chance. In the letters, James tells her that the incident 15 years ago was him and that he won't miss this time. He informs her that he still believes that there is a chance for them but only with me out the picture. I'm not a baby anymore, my father is well and truly out of the picture but the crazy in James' brain won't let it go. The next letter tells her that he will burn the house down. If he can't have her, no one else will. The next letter informs my mother that he has told social services that she is a trunk and that they will come and take me away. Not hard to prove that false so we don't panic. The next letter tells her that he will burn the house down. If he can't have her, no one else will. This one she takes to the police. Upon investigation, it is revealed that an ex of James, with the same first name as my mother, has a restraining order against him for stalking and attempted arson. We are put on high alert and the process for a restraining order is begun. A few nights later, my mom hears someone outside the house. Thinking it's him, she calls the police. They arrive within five minutes and search the street. No James, but his car is found behind the resident garages. He doesn't return to it that night. The next day, the police contact a woman's hostel in a neighboring county. They have a room spare, so we pack our bags and head there. And so the summer of my life was spent in hiding, no friends, no social media. Well, I wasn't supposed to have social media, but using proxy servers on the computer in the teen's rec room, I was the only teen in the hostel at this point was easy, and possibly very stupid. James began messaging me through Facebook, playing nice, telling me how much he loved my mom, and needed to know that she was okay. I ignored him and blocked his account. I had a number of fake accounts try to befriend me and they were all blocked also. After three months they find us a new house. We have a week to go back and pack up our old lives. So that's what we do and now it's eight years later and I've moved several times since including for university and honestly haven't given much thought to the man who wanted to kill me so he could be with my mother. Two years ago I moved back up north not far from my birthplace. Two weeks ago I received an email on an old email account for a rental agreement. At first I thought it was spam but upon opening it the name of the top read to James Smith and the rental address was not too far from me, only a town away. That sick guy gave my email to the renters as his so that I would know he was nearby. I've heard nothing else but I seriously hope that we don't ever meet again.
This just happened to me a few nights ago and I am still shaken up, so bear with me. I am a female bartender at a small cafe that doubles as a venue. During the day we serve coffee and lunch, and at night we have a full bar with bands, comedy shows, etc. On this night, there was an open mic comedy show. Not a lot of comedians showed up, so we ended up closing up shop early and I was ready to go home. I had a patron come in and order a single beer during the comedy show. He was acting nervous. I get customers that are shy or don't want to talk to people so I didn't think much about it. He sat down, sipped his beer, and watched the show. Since we closed early, everyone was pretty much gone and I wanted to lock up and clean so I could get home. After I escorted the last couple out of the bar and got ready to lock the door, I see the man from earlier walk down the back hallway and into the men's restroom. Not even a minute later, he burst through the door yelling, hurry, come back here, I need help. I stood at the opposite end of the hallway and asked him what was wrong. The toilet is overflowing, there's water all over the floor, help me, help me clean this up. I could tell that something was wrong and I replied, it's okay man, it happens, I'll mop it up, I'm just trying to close it up right now. He continued to argue with me, trying to get me to come into the bathroom with him as I stood about 20 feet away down the hallway. Finally, he walks towards me very aggressively and tries to grab my arm. You need to come back here now, he says. I immediately put my hands out in front of me so he cannot come any closer and I tell him he has to leave. He walks outside and I lock the door behind him. I check the bathroom and it is completely spotless, no water on the floor at all. I flush the toilet and the urinal and they are both working fine. I start to get nervous and I take my large pocket knife and clip it to my waistband of my pants just in case. As I'm cleaning our espresso machine and putting toppers in the liquor bottles, I hear a tapping noise. I look up at the front of the store, which is one big window that has a few curtains covering it. The same man is tapping on the window, waving at me and laughing like a maniac. I watch him walk over to the door and pull on it. It doesn't open since I had locked it after he left. He starts screaming and pounding on the glass, saying, Open the door, I'm gonna kill you. Fight overcame flight at this point and I walked around the counter and about six feet from the door. I pulled out my knife and locked eyes with him and yelled, I'm calling the cops, get out of here. He smiled and walked out of the view of the window. At this point, all of my adrenaline had crashed. I locked myself in the office and called 911 crying, explaining that I'm alone and a man tried to lure me into the bathroom and was outside trying to get into my bar. I waited an hour and a half, no police showed up. I called my boyfriend and he drove up to the shop. My manager watched the security cameras from home, making sure that the man didn't come back. I did the deposit and immediately drove home, my boyfriend following close behind me. My male busboy has been coming into work with me so I'm not alone, and the managers have been keeping an eye on the security cameras while I'm working. This story happened more than 10 years ago when I was still a student. A bit of backstory. As with most students, I was always broke and had a few ventures apart from my part-time job to bring me extra money. One of them was house and pet sitting. I have always had a love for animals, so when this couple contacted me to ask to house sit for them for the last few days before they returned for their overseas trip, as the last sitter had bailed on them and their 6 month old golden retriever puppy would be alone, I jumped at the opportunity. The fact that they promised to pay me the full 2 week fee for staying there less than a week and made it just more appealing. Little did I know how bad it would turn out. I got the details, got the keys from the agent and headed over to the house as it was already after 5pm and almost dark, as it was early spring. I got to the house, which was a really nice place, but it bordered a not so good area that was and still is prone to crime, house break-ins, robberies, etc. The first four nights went without a hitch, watching movies, jacuzzi, and just generally enjoying myself. The owners would have returned on the fifth day, fairly late at night. I went over to check on the dog. I got a call from them at about 10 p.m. saying their flight got delayed so they're going to stay in a hotel and do the three and a half hour drive back the following morning and asked if I could sleep there again that night, which was fine. I was already there and had my overnight bag still in my car. I called my dad to let him know of the plans as I was still staying with my parents and he specifically asked what the address was. I normally did not give them details like that because I was old enough to look after myself. I still believe to this day that probably saved my life. I eventually got to bed about 1 a.m. and it felt like I had only slept 5 minutes when I was awoken to a window breaking, and I could hear movement in what sounded like footsteps running down the hallway. The first thing I did was grab my phone and just hit redial. Thanks to my old Motorola phone, redialing was as simple as pressing one button, as my dad was the last number that I had called, hoping that he wakes up from the call. I then dropped the phone in between the headboard and mattress in case my dad picks up and he can hear what is going on. I had barely done that when the first guy stormed through the bedroom door. I could see a silhouette and he had a knife in his hand. When he saw 
saw it, he raised it and came at me. Now one thing to those that are unfamiliar with South Africa and the crime. Robberies and house invasions usually are very brutal and violent. People get murdered or tortured if they are in the slightest retaliate or don't cooperate with the robbers. Out of instinct, I raised my legs back when he came at me, and when he came within reach, I kicked both legs out as hard as I can. When I kicked and made contact with the guy, he completely lifted off the ground and shot into the wall. Luckily, the knife shot out of his hand as well. Before he got the chance to get up, I was on top of him, driving my right knee into his face and in return, his head into the wall. I knew that my life depended on it, so I put in some extra force. The guy dropped like a sack of potatoes, but before I could get up, I heard the sound of a pistol cock and I froze. It felt like all the blood drained from my body and I just became numb. He stood like that with the pistol against my head for probably less than 10 seconds. I did not move and he eventually said in very broken English to get on the bed face down. I panicked but thought if he wanted to shoot me that he'd already would have done so. So I did as he said. He threw a blanket over me and I turned into a fetal position with my back against the wall just so if they wanted to stab me that I had my legs and arms in front to protect my body. Now by that time I had forgotten that I had called my dad and the guy that I had, Need, is still down. I heard a third guy come into the room and I could hear what sounded like Portuguese to me. I could not understand what they said but I recognized it as we used to go to Mozambique on holiday a lot and that is the main language spoken there. The one guy tried to get the guy that I put down off the ground while the other started to ransack the house, shoving valuables into a big bag. It was about at this time that I heard tires screeching and a car approaching at what sounded like Mach 2. The car skittled to a halt right in front of the gate and I heard someone scream. It was my dad. The three inside the house panicked and ran out the back door and tried to jump the fence. My dad opened fire, shooting in their general direction. I grabbed the house keys and pressed the gate remote and my dad called the police while he came in. I met him at the front door and we walked out to the car to wait there for the police. It took them over an hour to get there. Some excuse of no vehicle available. By that time I had calmed down and started to look for the dog. I could not find her anywhere. I grabbed a flashlight from my dad and started scanning the surrounding yard and as I got to the corner I could see her laying on the ground. I got to her and saw she was dead. Later autopsies revealed she was poisoned and the police found pieces of meat laced with poison near the fence. Poisoning is pretty standard practice in my country for dealing with dogs at a house or area that is targeted for a break in a robbery. I was fuming and so sad. The police was also pretty useless and had a I don't give a crap attitude and barely took our statements. By that time it was starting to get light and I retrieved my bag, phone, and locked the house as good as I can without touching anything and drove home behind my dad. Only when I got home I got the story from my dad's side. He said he answered my call only to hear the shouting and what sounded like fighting going on. And when I did not respond he flew out of the house and raced over. Luckily he asked me for the address the previous night and he knows the area well to know exactly which house it is. Now my dad got there pretty quickly and he said he stayed on the line the whole time. Only hanging up when he stopped at the gate. My parents house is about 6 miles from there through a residential area. It's normally about a 20 minute drive. The call duration was 7 minutes and 13 seconds. I met the detective there later that day, gave my statement, they took fingerprints etc and the owners got back about the same thing. The rest of the day was a blur as I came down from the shock and adrenaline. Now that is not where the story ends. About 7 or 8 months later I got a call from the detective telling me they caught the guys. The one that I had in need apparently was the leader of the group. He had 4 counts of murder, I think 8 to 9 for attempted murder, multiple assaults, aggravated assault, over 100 house break-ins and robbery. I was shocked. The detective told me that if I had not taken him out first and fast that night, I would have definitely not gotten away so lightly. Now, this is also not where the story ends. Three days later, I get another call from the detective saying that I should be careful as he had escaped from custody and they have not caught him yet. I was not worried too much as the robbery wasn't at my house and I had changed cars so he would probably not find me. Also, I got my firearm license and carried my pistol on me 24-7. I did not hear anything after that until about two years later when I saw the detective in the grocery shop. We started talking about the case and she told me that he was killed during a home invasion. He broke into the wrong house and the owner was waiting for him pistol in hand. Shot him once in the stomach and one in the neck. This whole ordeal has made me more vigilant, heightened my situational awareness and made me a little paranoid to double and triple check all doors, locks, etc. But I'm just glad that they were brought to justice. 
Back in the winter, I had returned home to New York City and was getting used to the usual schlep on the subway to get to and from work and around the city in general. I had just left a cancer fundraiser event around 7pm and was only going a few stops over to where my house was on the end train. My little sister and I sat chatting quietly as the train began to move. A medium build man with a grey pea coat and a beanie made contact with me and hurried over. He bent down close to my face, extending his arm out for a handshake and said, Hello there, you are very beautiful, how you doing, what's your name? I sort of just recoiled back, giving him a confused, what are you doing in my personal space kind of look, shaking my head in a clear disinterest to make his acquaintance. All of a sudden, it was like a switch flip and his previously sweet tone turned to an ugly rage. You think you're better than everybody? Get out of your clown. He screamed at the top of his lungs and I noticed everyone turning and staring in our direction. Screw you anyway. He made a waving off gesture while I kind of just sat there staring at him wide eyed wondering what he was going to do next. His entire stance was very aggressive. He then stopped screaming and to my surprise made a direct pass to try the exact same thing on my sister who was right next to me. Wow, you are beautiful too, can I shake your hand? And he reached directly next to me to touch her. I extended my arm and said firmly, hey, leave my sister alone and back up out of our space. This guy smacks my hand out of the way. Now he's fully pushed my buttons. I stand up and realize I'm about eye level with him, so he must have been around 5 foot 9, maybe 5 foot 11 at most. Don't touch my sister, I said, and I was officially heated. This part is a blur as I don't remember what he said when he pushed me and we began to scuffle, but I landed a very sweet uppercut on his jaw. This enraged him and he had me on my back within seconds, kicking me and screaming I will kill you. After what felt like an eternity, two good people of the subway had run up behind me and grabbed him off of me. I heard one guy say leave her alone dude and when I looked up I saw several horrified passengers staring at us as we engaged in a full on brawl. Adrenaline was pumping through my veins so everything was bright and my vision was pinpoint and I felt numb. The conductor said something over the speakers about holding the train at the platform, and I stood there shaking as the guys threw him onto the platform and made a barrier between the platform and door as he attempted to get back into the car, clawing at the air and sputtering curses at me, staring me dead in the eye. The subway doors finally closed, locking him out. He pounded on the doors as though possessed by a demon, screaming so loud you could see every vein in his neck as he pounded on the glass. His eyes were so bloodshot they almost glowed red, and his voice was so loud it pierced through the entire car. I will kill you. Then the subway car pulled away from the station. Someone pointed to the ground. He had dropped his cell phone in the altercation. It was unlocked. I found out everything I could about this crazed stranger. His name, his social media handle, saw all of his selfies, the fact that he had been trying very hard and was unsuccessful at getting laid. His text messages revealed he was a drug dealer of some sort. I suspected crack because of the prices, increments, and wording of the text, which would also kind of explain his violent outburst. I had seen my fair share of crazy New York City, but it hadn't gotten this up close and personal in years. I was shook and emotional following the attack. I went to the police station with my aunt and uncle soon after to file a report. I gave them his full name and they said they had a lot of people in the system with the same name. I said, well, I have all the specific info I got off the phone. They said they couldn't use anything off the phone without a warrant. They ended up taking his cell phone from me and nothing ever really came of it, except for the huge bruise I had from getting a blunt kick to the thigh. An officer came by my house a few months later with some photos of extremely similar looking men, none of which I could confidently identify as my assailant. Haven't heard a single thing since I filed the report and I couldn't find the guy on social media again. I just hope the man is found and arrested. So, a little backstory. I was a dancer for six years. I have worked in many cities and clubs. At the time of the story, I wasn't a rookie. I was well versed in the industry. At the time this took place, I was like 20 or 21. It was also in Texas at one of the upscale clubs. I never imagined something like this would happen in this place, but apparently I was wrong. I started my shift at about 6pm. I like to get there early, meet with some of my regulars before the crowds come in. It was like 8.39 and this really good looking guy came in with some friends. They were all older, like 40 to 45. I grabbed some of my hustle friends and we went and sat with them. It wasn't hard to convince these guys into a VIP room with a bottle service, but this is where it kind of gets weird. The guy I was talking to wanted a separate room for just us. I thought maybe because his friends seemed rowdy and wanting to party hard, he wanted to have a more relaxed area. I wasn't complaining because this meant I wouldn't have to share my cut of the room, so stupid me saw dollar signs and went with it. We get some mixed drinks and shots. Now a lot of the guys that come into strip clubs really want to let loose and brought drugs as well. These guys had just about everything besides crack, meth, and heroin. I was definitely a party girl at the time too, so yes I partook in some of these. So at this time, we were all hanging out 
out in one room together. I took a little hit of coke off the back of my hand and continued drinking. After we were all hyped up and ready to party, my guy pulled me into the other room. This guy was like 6 foot 4, obviously worked out a lot and was attractive. I on the other hand without my heels was 5 foot 6 and was like 120. I sat down in his lap and I started talking to him and laying down my moves to get him to empty his wallet basically. We were having a really good conversation and my bouncers were really good about checking up on the girls in the rooms because they were pretty secluded on the second floor. After about 20 minutes of talking, something snapped and all of a sudden he literally put his hands around my neck, lifted me up and slammed me against the back of the couch. The couch backs were tall and padded so it wouldn't have been heard on the other side plus with all the music. I was literally frozen in fear. After almost 3 years of dancing I had never been in this situation. He started calling me names, spit in my face and his grip on my neck would get tighter when he would feel me take a deep breath like I was going to scream. Luckily there were also VIP rooms across the large overlook and a bouncer noticed me kicking and flailing. I faintly remember, like all the bouncers, running into the room. They had to pry me out of his hands. When I was finally back sitting on the couch, they had him on the floor outside the room and his buddies acted like they didn't even know him. My manager grabbed me and carried me like a baby to the dressing room, asked me if I needed any medical. I said no, I was just really shaken up. His buddies talked to my manager and basically gave me guilt money for that happening. Apparently he was going through a bad divorce and just snapped on me instead of his ex. When I was 18, I was living in a small town. I was friends with rowdy skaters around and they helped connect me with this dude who sold weed. He was 29 years old I think at the time. He gave me pretty good deals and lived nearby. I wasn't driving at the time so this was convenient for me. His name was Max. Max had always struck me as a weird dude. We had normal weed buying interactions that never lasted more than 10 minutes. Buy some weed, maybe smoke a bowl, that's it. He'd often tell me he could drop it off at my house but I never let him because as I said before, he was weird. I wasn't afraid of him, but was definitely aware that his offers to deliver to me were weird. One day in May of 2018, I was invited to a bonfire by the same rowdy skaters that introduced me to this guy. I had no idea he'd be there, nor was it important to me at all. I brought the guy I was dating at the time, I said hey to everyone including Max. We stayed for a couple hours and some of them played some music on their guitars. Nearing the time I was leaving the bonfire around 11pm, Max was getting upset about something and threw his guitar into the bonfire. I didn't know what he was angry or upset about and paid no mind to it. This happened as I was leaving with the guy I was dating. I went to bed and woke up to paragraphs on paragraphs of crazy texts from Max ranging from 1am to 5am. Like a constant stream of texts stating things such as, you know how much I loved you, you are cruel. He would go back and forth between saying, I would give you the world if you'd let me, and you really do deserve him though. He said really scary things like, you are a predator and should be snubbed out, just wait. And you are stuck, I will either love you or hate you to the fullest extent my powers behold. Right now I pray the worst death on you and that guy you're with. To top it all off he said, losing you is like losing a mother to me. He told me to tell him I never loved him and that I wouldn't hear from him again if I did. So that's what I did. I said, I never loved you. Do not message me again. I left it at that. I didn't get a response nor did I care to get one. Max had never expressed any romantic interest to me, asking me out or anything. This was all out of nowhere and he was 11 years older than me. I was barely 18. That night he cut his long hair off and posted photos naked on Facebook, curled up in fetal position talking about being a statue of shame. It's as if he had a breakdown, but I had no intention of causing that and didn't think I would even offend anyone by bringing this guy I was seeing. Everyone else seemed to like the guy that I brought. About a week later, Max texted me pretty late at night and asked if I had seen the flowers he spread along my sidewalk, saying that he stole every flower in the vicinity of my neighborhood that night. I asked how he knew where I lived and said, I hadn't seen the flowers so he must have had the wrong house. I also told him he shouldn't do that as I never Never felt anything for him and so on. He told me that he had heard I lived on the same block as another one of the skater guys I had and he wasn't wrong. The skater guy I lived by was on the other side of the block and I never walked that way so I never saw the flowers. I blocked his number and didn't hear from him again for weeks. Weeks later I woke up after a rough night and there were loads of flowers on the sidewalk right outside my house along with a little bouquet at the top of my walkway. I was pissed. I wasn't scared yet and stupidly I unblocked his number and texted him asking why there were flowers outside of my house. This confirmed that this indeed was where I lived. I still to this day feel so stupid for texting him and making it known that after weeks he had found my house. He responded saying, hmm, sounds nice, that was me. I blocked his number again. 
About a week later, I was out of town and my roommate texted me a photo of a heart with a peace sign inside of it and my name written under it drawn in chalk outside our house. When I got back into town, I went to the courthouse and began the process of getting a stalking order against him. When I left the courthouse, I went to Max's work and told him he needed to stop this behavior and that he was stalking me. He looked me in the eyes with no facial expression and said, if you don't leave, I am calling the cops. I got angry and said loudly, call the cops, I was just talking to them about you, and left his work in a rage. Soon after this, I began driving again. I once drive by him and he noticed it was me. The next day I woke up with my car covered in flowers. I presented my case to the judge and she put the stalking order in place. He was served with it by police officers and I thought that was that and he wouldn't be bothering me again. I was wrong. After the stalking order was served, he made several other chalk messages on my sidewalk, left random gifts for me like chalk and beheaded my little pony heads on beer bottles. I always brought these things to the police station but they said I needed to catch him doing it, take a photo or get a security camera. So I got a security camera and really hoped I would catch him. It turned out my security camera was stupid and I couldn't just watch the videos it took but had to skip through second by second by hand. It was an impossible task. I was terrified of leaving my house at night at this point. I never had my curtains open anymore and I was so frustrated that my livelihood was being taken away from me. Ultimately, I unblocked his number in hopes that he would text me directly violating the stalking order and after a few days, it worked. He sent me a weird text saying, forgive me, we are charming, this is harming, let us try again. By now it's September of 2018 and he finally goes to jail. He is facing up to a year in jail and has to stay there until I record date. I finally start calming down. I am able to go outside at night, even if just to get into my car. I let myself have my curtains open sometimes. I am starting to feel alive again. Right when I start feeling secure in my small town life again, someone posted bail and he was released after only 3 months in jail and I went back to living in fear. We still had court dates coming up and I was optimistic that he would serve more time for ruining my life for so long. His lawyer kept pushing the court date back to gather evidence and after about 6 months of pushing it back, the state decided he wouldn't do anything more and closed the case basically. I had moved out of town 3 plus hours away at this point so he didn't actually have an option to continue this behavior. Living in this new place I feel safe. I can walk at night and I don't have to have my curtains closed all the time. It's been over a year since they decided to close the case. About a month ago, he began responding to my friend's Instagram stories. Friends that live here in this new town, telling them how fond he is of me, etc. I have always had him blocked, but my Instagram isn't private, so he must have found them that way. I have since changed my account to private, and he hasn't messaged any more friends of mine. I refuse to be fearful now, the way I was then. He will never find where I live or where I work now. However, my life is forever changed after this experience. I will always be more aware of people and their weird energy. He ruined my life for a year, and I truly wish he had gotten that time in jail. He deserves it. So I, a 19 year old female, was at a house party a couple days ago. I only really knew a couple of people there, and it was packed. I hung around with my two friends there for a while, having some drinks. After a while, my friends went into this room that everyone was hotboxing. I didn't go because I really didn't feel like drinking and being stoned at a party where I barely knew anyone, so I just mingled for a bit, then went on my phone talking to my other friends. I noticed this guy that keeps staring at me up and down, and instantly felt my stomach sink. I instantly had a bad feeling about the guy. I looked back down at my phone and sent my location to my friends, just letting them know where I was because things were changing from feeling chill to sketchy. There were a bunch of cans of soda in the kitchen, so I got up to grab a Sprite instead of having any more drinks. As I'm there, the same guy that kept looking at me comes in and started trying to get me to take this drink in a red solo cup. I was like, nah, I have a Sprite, thanks though. He kept trying though and I was getting annoyed because he kept being super pushy about it and I'm pretty blunt so I just said, look, I don't don't want your drink or your company and walked away. I thought that'd be the end of it and pushed it to the back of my mind as one of my friends came out from the hot box room stoned and happy. We hung out some more and my friend wanted a cigarette so I went out on the balcony with her. As we're there, she put her cigarettes on the ledge and as she's talking gibberishly, her arm pushed her cigarettes off and they fell down into the yard. I was gonna go downstairs and outside with her to get them, but she told me she had to grab something from her car anyways and that she'd be right back. I decided just to wait there for her. I'm on my phone and hear the door open and I expected it to be her. As I'm about to say, that was quick, I spin around and now I'm face to face with that guy from earlier. He just grabbed my face and kissed me and I pushed at his chest and said, dude, did you not hear what I said? He proceeded to say something in Spanish. I can't speak Spanish, but I could tell it was Spanish. I told him to screw off and went to push past him to go back 
inside, and he proceeded to push me up against the wall outside and try to kiss on my neck. That's when I pushed him away as hard as I could, but he then let go of my wrist and grabbed my throat hard while maintaining eye contact and smirking at me the whole time. Just when he used his other hand and grabbed my butt, my friend came back from getting her cigarettes, poked her head out, saw what was happening, and she tried to intervene but he pushed her with his other hand. I heard her say, oh nah. She grabbed the closest guy to the door from inside and brought him out. Random heroic guy from inside then grabbed the crazy throat grabber, putting him in some type of hold and started screaming at him. He got kicked out, pretty sure someone punched him in the face too. Everyone was super apologetic and said they didn't even know that guy and weren't sure who he even was. I wasn't about to call the cops or anything because I didn't want to get the party busted. But I went to the bathroom and immediately broke down crying. Called my friends. My friends here weren't sober enough to drive and they came to get me. I have a couple finger mark bruises on my neck still and I'd hate to think of what would have happened had my friend been distracted by something and not came outside when she did. All I know is I'm not going to a party where I barely know anyone anymore. That was scary. This happened when I was 4 or 5 years old. I was at a rather large toy store with my dad and sister, who was 2 years older than me, so that I could pick out a birthday present for a friend of mine. My dad and I were looking at the Lego aisle they had available, while my sister was shuffling around, bored out of her mind. At some point she wandered away. I was looking at the box of a castle set, wishing that it was my birthday coming up, when my sister returned and tugged on my dad's arm. What is it, sweetheart? He asked, without looking away from the box he was holding. I think he also wished it was his birthday it coming up. There's a man, oh never mind, he's gone now. My dad looked at her, putting the box back on the shelf. What man, he asked. There was a man who asked if I wanted to come see his puppy, and I said that I'd have to ask you first, but I don't know where he went. My dad took the box out of his hands and put it back on the shelf, then took my hand in his and put his other hand around my sister's shoulders. Well, let's go find him, my dad exclaimed, and began leading us toward the checkouts. Now, like I said, this toy store was rather large, and we were walking pretty fast. When we got near the checkouts, my sister pointed at a man who was just about to leave the store and said, that's him. I could see how she recognized him from behind, as he had very long hair. It went halfway down his back. I remember him having a black winter coat on, which was strange because it was a pretty warm day. We walked even faster until we were at the nearest checkout, and my dad said to us, stay here with this nice lady for a second, referring to the cashier. He then ran up behind the man, who was now almost out the door, and threw his hand on his shoulder so hard I could hear it. My dad spun him around to face him, then began yelling, where's this puppy you wanted to show my daughter? People around started looking over at the commotion, and my dad continued, you wanted to take my daughter to see your puppy, where is it? I want to see the puppy too. The man was stammering and stuttering and trying to get away, but my dad had a firm grasp on the guy's shoulder. Turning his head to where we were standing, my dad yelled to my sister, is this the guy who asked you to come see his puppy? My sister silently nodded her head and then looked at her shoes. I think she thought that she was in trouble. I didn't blame her, our dad was yelling really loudly. Is the puppy in your car? Where's your car? Is that it over there? He pointed out the glass door into the parking lot. Or is that your car? Is that where the puppy you wanted to show my six-year-old daughter is? I remember thinking that if he just let go of the guy, he could lead us to the puppy. Before I knew it, three men in yellow jackets had come. There was a word on their jackets, which read security. My dad let go of the man, and the security guards held him instead. My sister was crying by this point. My dad walked back to us, once again taking my hand in one of his own, and putting the other around my sister's shoulders. He asked the cashier if she had a phone he could use, and she took us to the office. He called our mom to come pick us up, then assured my sister that she was not in trouble. In fact, she was in the least amount of trouble anyone has ever been in the history of the world, simply by coming and asking for his permission to see the puppy. I asked him if we were still going to see it, and he just looked at me and said, sorry son, the puppy ran away. Our mom came in just a few minutes, and as we were leaving, there were police cars pulling up. Are they going to help find the puppy? My sister asked my mom, but she said, no, they're here for something else. After a while, I remembered this incident and recently asked my dad about it. Apparently, when the cops searched his car, they found rope, duct tape, a knife, pliers, and a hacksaw. My dad and sister testified at his trial, and the guy got 20 years. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you.
This story dates back to about a year and a half ago when my daughter was around 4 months old. I'm 26 years old. I had just moved with my then SO to a dangerous part of town, but the street we moved to wasn't too bad. Everyone knows their neighbors and everyone seems to get along. Well, since everyone in the neighborhood chats with each other, one of my neighbors warned my SO and I about a homeless woman that parks her van on the street and harasses everyone who walks by her car, and to try and avoid her as best as possible. Side note, parking in this town is street parking only. No reserved parking spots. This will have significance later. I thought, eh, that's one small downside of living here, along with the street parking. Not that big of a deal as long as I avoid her, right? Wrong. So the next day after our neighbor's warning, after returning home from a long day at work and picking up my infant daughter, homeless lady, really slender, wearing what appeared to be newish clothes, breath reeking of something foul, is walking up to the left side of the sidewalk, screaming up a storm at these teenage kids who look terrified. The teenagers aren't engaging her, just keep walking walking and looking at each other with uncertainty. I stay on the right side of the sidewalk even though I knew I'd have to cross the small street to the left where my apartment was located. My daughter wakes up from her nap in my arms and begins to coo. Homeless lady spots me crossing the street with my purse, work bag, my baby, her baby bag, and decided it's a good idea to come up and chat me up about her conspiracy theories as I'm walking up to my apartment. Fine, no big deal. At least she's not bothering the kids anymore. Then as I'm fumbling to get my keys to open the gate that leads to my complex, she asked for money. I told her the truth, I'm sorry but I don't carry cash on me. All the while trying to hold onto my baby, find my keys, hold my bags, her response, stuck up lady. And then she continues muttering under her breath, which I must repeat was bad, and starts harassing more kids down the block. A couple months go by and she continuously comes up to harass me, as if she doesn't recall who I am every single day. Every day I politely apologize and say I need to get home, or I don't have any money, still, or I simply don't have time to chat right now. Every answer I gave her was met with an insult both directly and under her breath. At this point, I am still not concerned. I've always had a soft spot for the homeless, and I am aware that this lady has severe mental illness. I always apologize for not having money to give, even through the insults. One night, around midnight, my daughter wakes up crying horribly. My SO and I take her temperature, 103 fever. I tell him it's time to take her to the emergency room immediately before it gets worse. We gather everything up, and I gently take her from bed and lay her against my chest. She's so helpless, weak, burning hot, and whimpering terribly. I still want to up thinking about it to this day. So as we walk out of the apartment, my SO says he will run down three blocks to grab the car. Remember, it's all street parking, so we often had to park blocks away. I say okay, I'll stand in front of the apartment so he could just pick us up and we can book it to the ER. Wrong choice. I watched as he ran all the way down the street and turned the corner out of sight. Then I look back at my baby and start rocking and shushing her, so that maybe she could get a little bit of sleep slash rest before being up at the hospital all night. Moments later, when I look up, homeless lady walks around the same corner that Esso just ran around and makes a beeline straight towards me. I get a little uneasy as I have a sick baby in my hands, but maybe she'll leave me alone this time, right? Nope, that was wishful thinking to the max. I'll label homeless lady as HL and me as me. Homeless lady, and a voice loud enough to wake up the entire block, oh hey there sis, daddy just told me that baby's done sick and she needs a healer. Me, still trying to gently rock my baby as she startled back awake and wondering why he told this lady about my baby being sick. Uh, what? Sorry? Homeless lady, I'm a healer. My mom and I have been healers since birth. Give me that baby. Me, still trying to give her the benefit of the doubt, knowing she's mentally ill. Sorry, I'm waiting on her dad to bring the car around so we can take her to the hospital. Can you keep your voice down? She's trying to sleep. Homeless lady, nah girl, I'm a healer, didn't you hear me? I done said I was a healer. You know what a healer is, don't you? Give me that baby. Now at this point, she reached out and put her incredibly dirty hands on my daughter's leg slash foot and wouldn't let go. Me, excuse me, let her go now. Homeless lady, give me that baby. Me, she's very sick, you're waking her up. Stop. Her, let me heal her. Me, if you don't let go right now, I will kill you. It was at this point that she and I locked eye contact, and her facial expression was what I can only describe as the most terrifying, evil look a person can give, with her eyes and smile widening with every passing second. She then broke out in a laugh so loud and terrifying that I can't believe I didn't piss myself. By this time, my daughter was crying hysterically. My internal dialogue went something like this, Where is SO? I'm gonna have to set my sick infant daughter on the ground and beat this lady up just to get her to not kidnap my kid. It also crossed my mind that if I did that, I'd probably be the 
the one arrested. Like a Hail Mary, my SO comes around the corner in the car and I reiterate to the lady that my SO is now here and if she doesn't stop harassing me, I will kill her. This finally struck some chord inside her brain and she took off running down the street, cursing profanities very loudly. My daughter's cry has me in tears too after being yanked so hard by this lady. I still wonder what could have happened if she yanked hard enough to take my sick daughter. My SO ended up admitting that he felt bad for her, so he told her that our baby was sick and even struck up a conversation with her about it. All the while his daughter and I were waiting outside past midnight alone in a bad area for him. Needless to say, he's now my ex. He even later laughed about the entire thing and told me I was exaggerating and she was harmless. He also still struck up regular conversations with the woman after that anytime he'd see her and it infuriated me. I don't think anyone who would have seen the look in this woman's face would label her as harmless. She looked very much like she was ready to harm. From 2006 to 2011, I worked in the electronics department at the local Walmart in the small city I lived in. Through those five years I had worked there, I had plenty of creepy encounters with strange customers, especially considering the state hospital was directly across the road. This story isn't just a regular old creepy encounter, but something that would lead me to being stalked for nearly a year. It all started in 2010 on a night I was working second shift. I was doing my end of shift ritual when a woman in her late 40s interrupted me. She was with a little girl no more than three or four years old. Excuse me, I need help with my cell phone. She spoke softly and proceeded to tell me her problem. I need to turn my phone into a straight talk phone. The girl earlier said you could do it. I said, sure, let me see what I can do. She handed me a six-year-old phone from Verizon and I knew as soon as I saw it, I wouldn't be able to do what she wanted. I explained that she would have to buy a new phone from straight talk and transfer her old number. Basic stuff, really. Now, I always took my job seriously and held myself to the highest standard of customer service. I did nothing to actually piss off this lady, but sure as it is, she was pissed. Why would I buy a new phone? I already have one. She starts screaming at the top of her lungs. Her claims of me upselling her and being a corporate goon. I finally managed to defuse the situation, and as she left the apartment, she gives me the classic, you'll never get a job in this town again. As I'm getting ready to leave my shift, my manager stops me and tells me, I got a complaint at customer service from a lady claiming I swore at her granddaughter. Apparently, I told her to screw off. I explained what happened, he just just laughed it off. My managers knew it was very unlike me to say anything like that to a customer. I wish the story ended there. For the next several weeks, I would get complaints about things I'd never done, sometimes even on my days off. I would come into questions from management nearly every day. It was complaints ranging from me being rude to a customer all the way to me doing drugs in the parking lot on break. All these complaints were coming from two women. As it turned out, it was the cell phone lady and her adult daughter. It turns out they have even been scoping out my work schedule and started coming in nearly every every day. They would walk through electronics to make sure they saw me and later that night I would have a complaint. This happened for months. It happened so much management deemed her, my name, favorite customer. To be honest, I didn't care much. I even thought it was pretty funny. I never got in trouble and everyone knew these ladies and just blew it off. I started caring when she took it to a new level. She started to follow me around. I would see her when I was around town. She made it clear she knew where I lived and would regularly walk by my house. I would see her standing out front just looking at my place. I began getting complaints complaints to the city about my property, grass too tall, the old shed in my yard, my fire pit, basically everything. She even found out my girlfriend's name and began complaining at her job. I knew it was her. She would make it so clear that she was following me. Sometimes she would stop in and ask me questions at work and act like the nicest customer. A few times she asked me things like, how's your girlfriend or my favorite? How can you afford that big house on your little Walmart wage? For about seven months she stalked and slandered me. I started telling her I knew what she was doing and to stop but she played it off. I couldn't report her. She never once threatened me. She was just making my life hard. By this time, everyone in my life knew about this woman. One night, I'm grabbing dinner with my friends from work and we're joking about it when someone says, what if you just counter stalk her? At first, I thought it was a terrible idea, but this convinced me it would work and they would all help me. So we hatched a plan. It went as follows. Find her job, find her name and address. Make complaints in the same manner as her. Find out all the rumors she told about me. Make it clear that we know, show her that we have numbers. I found out her information easily enough. Turns out she didn't live anywhere near me. I was even friends with a few of her co-workers. They would keep me informed on crazy stuff she said about me and even told her to stop. 
we began doing exactly what she was doing to me. We did this for about four months. The more we dug into her life, the more I found out about how obsessed she was over getting me in trouble. She had claimed that I assaulted her. She urged others to report me and follow me. She told police I was a potential drug dealer. Eventually, we won though. She started putting together that there were six of us digging into her life and asking questions about her. My last month at work, I didn't get a single complaint. In fact, I never even saw her anymore. The day after I quit though, I heard she was in the store complaining about a new person after asking one of the managers why I quit. I'll honestly never understand why she was so bent on destroying me. I just told her to buy a $20 prepaid phone. I work about a mile from my house, in a pretty small town, 100,000 people-ish, spread out. I grew up in one of the largest cities in the states, so living here has been a bit of a culture shock. It's very easily accessible by walking, so I never drive. About half a year ago, I finished work around 1am. Nobody is really out past 8pm here. A huge shock coming from a big city, so the park I walked through was utterly deserted. I live in one of the safest countries in the world, not America anymore, so it's easy to forget just how vulnerable I still am. I honestly didn't feel uncomfortable at any point in my walk until I rounded the corner past some basketball courts nearby my house. I was still about two minutes away from home and this stretch of my walk was completely dark. The moon was massive that night. While I had welcomed its light at the beginning of my journey and the absence of streetlights, it actually made things look pretty eerie. I had walked this path hundreds of times but tonight something fell off. I'm not a fearful person in any sense of the word but I was really on edge suddenly. Then I saw it, a van in the parking lot next to the courts with its side door open. I picked up my pace and kept an eye on it. There are usually cars in that parking lot. I live in a tourist town and backpackers often stay in their vehicles to save money. I'd never seen one with its door hanging open like that in the middle of the night though. I was so focused on the van that I missed the man walking out from the trees near the courts. Until he was a mere 30 feet behind me, he was walking fast and there was little doubt that he was heading straight towards me. I was at a loss for what my next action should be. Screaming wouldn't do much, I was still too far away from any residences. I usually carry a glass water bottle with me for protection. We have very strict laws on weapons, but had left it at work that night. My phone was dead, everything I knew better than to do I'd done. I hesitated running on the off chance that he didn't mean to act sketchy. I also knew I couldn't outrun him. I saw a little dark blur darting across the library parking lot at the back of the courts. It didn't even register to me what it was. The whole situation was so surreal. The guy was behind me now and judging by his footsteps, he hadn't veered course. I quickened my pace, felt out my keys in my purse, and slipped them in between my fingers. I heard a slight jingling noise and everything suddenly made sense. The blur was Apollo, the large black cat that often walked me home on the stretch after the park. Tonight, he was doing that weird cat run, where they get really low to the ground with their ears back. I had an impression that he was angry, but he was moving too fast for me to see his face properly as he rushed past me. I kept walking, but the heavy footsteps were retreating now. I didn't dare look back, and kept moving forward quickly. Apollo was suddenly by my side, still staying low to the ground and stopping every few feet to look behind him and hiss. Then, he would do that weird cat run to catch up with me. He walked the whole way home with me, as he had done so many times, but I'd never seen him act like that. As we neared my gate, he visibly relaxed and flopped on his back. I coaxed him inside the gate before giving him some massive hugs and head bumps. I stopped walking home by myself at night and still saw my sweet little cat friend often. I never saw him behave that way again though. Apollo moved away three months ago. I still miss my little buddy and often think about how strange that night was. I wish I'd turn around to see him chase the guy off. I've heard so many stories about dogs protecting people, but rarely about cats. I am 20 years old. I live in the suburbs in a small residence of six houses. My gate is very often broken, including today. That means 80% of the time it is wide open, so everyone can fit into the small courtyard. My house has one floor. There are four bedrooms, including mine, and downstairs there is a guest bedroom, which is used as a treatment room because I have big health concerns. This is where all the equipment, medicines are stored, like morphine and doses that could kill an average person, and this is where the care takes place. Also, I have a dog. I am very close to him. He is a little bit all of my life. He feels everything to the point of feeling my epileptic seizures before they happen. To recognize the nurses who are arriving, he recognizes by the sound of their tires when they arrive in the yard. He never barks except when there is a problem. And finally, a nurse spends four to five times a day to give me care at home, including infusions. This is important for the story. That morning, like every morning, my liberal nurse arrived at 8 a.m. For the rest of the story, I'll call her Sandra. She takes care of me as usual. That is to say, an infusion 
version of a painkiller. She replaces the antibiotic diffusers, she makes me do blood tests, and remakes the cassette of my morphine pump. We usually chat about everything and nothing. She tells me stories with patients during the treatment. My nurses are an integral part of my life. They have looked after me for six years now. She leaves after 40 minutes and says, see you later. I'm sure I'll be a little late. Don't worry. That day, I have a medical appointment in the morning, and I'm alone all day because my parents are working, except the nurse's passage every four hours. Once back from my meeting, I sit on the sofa with my dog while waiting for my nurse. After a while, I hear the tire noises. I get up because I think it's the nurse, but my dog started to growl behind the door. I look at the time, 11.50 a.m. I tell myself that it is a bit early, but sometimes instead of going after, my nurse exchanges me with the patient from before. I hear a knock. Surprised, I go to open it. Usually the nurses come in like that, and I see a young woman standing, whom I have never seen. She said to me, hello, are you my name? I'm Camille, a third year nursing student. Your nurse will be a little late, so she told me to come and start preparing and she will arrive. I'm not wary at all, I'm used to students coming, but I'm just a little surprised that Sandra didn't warn me, because usually she warns me in the morning or sends me a message, and then she never leaves a student alone when it's the first time we see each other. I tell myself she must have forgotten to tell me. I bring her in and show her the way to the treatment room. I take out the things for treatment while she washes her hands. My dog is weird. He growls at her as soon as she approaches me and he turns around me. I was embarrassed so I left him in the living room and closed the door to be quiet. I don't really care what she does so I let her do it. I'm on my phone at the moment. She begins to put the IV on the infusion stand and takes a syringe. Normally, we rinse my central catheter with a syringe of serum already made. You just have to open the packaging, and there I see it's not a pre-made syringe, but a syringe that she has prepared. I look up and see that the ampules for my treatments are intact and have not been opened, yet I did hear the sound of the ampules breaking. I'm starting to think it's weird, and there she starts to approach me to inject the syringe when I get a message from my nurse. I'll be there in five minutes. Can you start pulling out the material? My blood has only run for one spin. I got up and said, I'm just going to the toilet, I'll be right back. I ran and locked myself in the downstairs toilet, the whole time my dog was barking and growling. When I opened the door, he followed me straight up so we were both in the toilet. So I sent a message to my nurse, Camille, your student is here, don't worry. And then she replied, who? I started crying in the toilet and was really scared. Camille came by and asked, is everything okay? I think she could see I was staying a long time. I said, yes, it's going to happen. Then I heard my front door slam. Two minutes later, I hear it reopen but I hear my nurse. I came out of the toilet crying. She asked me what happened. I told her about it and showed the treatment room. So we called the police, they came and they examined, took samples, and the syringe and the rest of what Camille had prepared. The test results were received a few days after receiving the products in the syringe and the infusion. In the syringe was a paralyzer. She had put a dose that could have paralyzed a man of 120 kilograms. I'm 40 kilograms. And in the IV, it was medicine to lower the heart rate. But it was so concentrated it could have stopped anyone's heart. Today, we still don't know who Camille is. And luckily, I have never heard from her again. In retrospect, I realized that my dog had sensed that this person didn't want me well. And I tell myself that I should have watched her because she was just a student. And that my treatments are not paracetamol, and I keep wondering what could have happened if I hadn't looked at my phone. This happened about a year ago. There were so many terrible factors working against me that night. I am astounded I got away, at least physically. This all begins when I'm at my friend's apartment, who lives in a really rough part of town. In a series of poor decisions, that night I decided to get belligerently drunk and take a few pills of whatever knows what. I know, I know. Safe to say, after a solid night of partying, around 4am I was not in the right state of mind. My drugged brain decides that instead of staying the night at my friend's apartment like I normally would, I wanted to uber back to my own apartment. My friend's apartment had two separate entrances slash access to the building, one in the back, unlit parking lot of the building, and one facing the street. They had two sets of keys for each door, and I only had keys keys to the one in the back of the apartment. Since my Uber would obviously arrive at the street and the door in the front of the building locks itself behind you, I exited this way when the driver was soon to arrive. I'm not paying attention to my surroundings at all in this state, despite the fact that there was literally a bullet hole in the front door I just came out of. Not good. I remember checking to see what car I was getting picked up in, and was only able to pick out the fact that it was a black sedan. Soon after stepping outside, a black sedan pulls up to the curb and starts rolling down the window. So I stepped forward. Before this man even spoke, I could feel something was wrong. He had an expression like he was tearing me apart with just his eyes. After seeing that look, it gave me a new meaning to the word predator. To describe a criminal, 
criminal because I then knew what it felt like to be prey. He basically barks at me, I'm your Uber driver. This was the second red flag that somehow made its way through my brain. Normally Uber drivers just roll down the window and say your name. I think I just stared at him for a second, my brain slowly piecing together the situation I was potentially in, and I ask him, what's my name? He immediately is enraged and starts screaming about how he doesn't have time for this and just get in the car, etc. I don't think I've ever sobered up so fast in my life. I'm completely panicking. Obviously, this wasn't my Uber. Quickly checking the license plate, I immediately see it's not a match. Meanwhile, this guy is still screaming at me, and I have absolutely no idea what to do. If I bolt in either direction, this guy could easily outrun me or have a weapon. I'm also pretty sure at this point that if he's trying to nab a random girl off the street, he must have a weapon of some sort. I can't run back into the apartment door right behind me since it locks behind you, and I don't have the keys, nor the time to unlock it. Running towards the back door would do nothing as well, as he He's idling right by the mouth of the driveway towards the back parking lot, and again, I would have to take the time to find the right keys and get in. If I screamed, I'm not exactly in the type of neighborhood where someone would try to be vigilant, and I could still hear the music radiating from my friend's third floor apartment. I knew they wouldn't hear me. Also, it's 4am and absolutely no one is around. It was the absolute worst feeling I've ever felt in my life. Everything in me wanted to run, but I felt that if I did, it would be the end of me. But if I kept standing there, staring in shock at this screaming man, the result would be the same. From when he started screaming at me to this point, I'm guessing only 20 seconds has passed by. Just as he's looking like he's getting ready to get out of the car, another black sedan pulls up right behind him. Checking the license plate as quickly as I can, I realize it's my actual Uber and make a full sprint to the car, really only like 6 steps, and throw myself in, screaming at my real Uber driver, what's my name? The poor dude looks terrified, but responds with my name quickly, to which I reply, get me out of here, that man is trying to kidnap me. If I was in this Uber driver's position, I think I would be too shocked to react as quickly as he did. But my dude flew out of there, offered to call the cops for me, which I declined and now regret, and then walked me to the front door of my apartment, ensuring I got inside safely. Truly an incredible human being. You can rest easy knowing he got the fattest tip my college student bank would allow for, although he deserved much, much more. I was one of those kids you see walking around zoos or amusement parks wearing a leash. Those were already a thing 20 plus years ago but less common, and were initially only tied around the wrist. In my case it was a necessity, I would always start wandering off from the rest of the family no matter what situation. This is one of the stories that led to me earning my leash. It happened when I was about 6 years old and I went to the zoo with my mom and sisters. Before every family outing my mom made sure to give me the talk about not walking off again or face the consequences. My mom was a strict parent that made good on her promises, she had to, being a single mother of three. I didn't try to disobey her per se, but I often just didn't pay attention to the world and people around me. No different this day, I behaved and followed the group for a while, but then a butterfly garden caught my attention and off I was. When I finally realized I separated myself from my mom and sisters again, I panicked and started walking around the zoo looking for them, being afraid for my mom's reaction more than anything else. After a while, I somehow got it in my head that if I could just walk out, find find our car and wait there, my family would eventually find me. So I did. I got lost within a couple of minutes, walking around a strange neighborhood looking for either our car or the way back to the zoo. Nothing looked familiar. I started crying. Then this man came up to me, just normal looking, about 40 years old, asking if I'm lost. I explained I lost my family when we were visiting the zoo and I'm looking for the way back. I couldn't believe my luck when the man told me he had just come from the zoo and saw a family there standing near the entrance who were waiting for a little girl with blonde hair and a baseball cap. But it was still a few blocks away so he proposed I walked with him to his car and we could drive the rest of the way back. Just the mention of his car finally made me hesitant. I told him I wasn't allowed to get in a car with strangers. My mom would be mad. He then said something like, that was true but I looked smart enough to know that if I could trust someone. Don't remember the exact words but something like it. Also, he added, he spoke to my parents earlier when they were looking for me. So he's not a complete stranger. That didn't seem right. I asked him if he really talked to my dad, who had died a year before and when he said he did, I broke down crying uncontrollably. I still didn't understand the situation I was in. I was just really confused about everything and scared of how angry my mom was going to be after all this. Finally, my crying caught the attention of the security guard of a parking
parking building we were standing next to, asking if there was something he could help with. The guy stepped aside with a security guard and started explaining the situation, but made it vaguely sound like he was my father and we were looking for his wife. The security guard seemed to believe him, pointing us in the right direction towards the zoo. The man thanks the security guard and proceeds to take my hand to walk away. The security guard takes a last look at me and asks me, in a comforting, friendly, adult-to-child kind of way, why I'm still crying. I tell him that my dad is dead. He looks really confused for a few seconds, then asks if the man is not my dad. I tell him again, no, my dad is dead. In a split second, his whole face and posture changes and he turns to look at the guy, who is trying to explain he never actually said he was my dad, that the security guard must have misunderstood and he was just helping me find my mom. The security guard said he appreciated the man's help, but he would take me out of his hands now and the guy immediately took off. I don't think there was much else the security guard could have done. I explained the whole situation and after making a phone call, he walked me to the entrance of the zoo, which was just around the corner from the parking building, and from there we were brought to the security's office where my mom and sisters were already waiting. I feel extremely lucky for the security guard being at the right place at the right time that day, and very grateful for the extra second of time he took that could have made all the difference. I, a 24 year old female at the time, was 21 years old. I lived in a larger small city in the Midwest. At the time, I had no car, a bicycle, and hardly enough money for the public buses. I worked at a retail battery, lighting, and repair store. I worked full time and only lived a little over a mile from my job. Because of my willingness to learn and my close proximity to work, I often worked all sorts of hours, mostly by myself. This time, I wasn't the person closing and had a co-worker Joey, 22-year-old male, who came in for a part-time shift after he wrapped up classes at the local college. We had a close friendship and we often stood up for each other and stood in when we were flustered or needed to go to the bathroom in the back. Joey received a phone call for a possible repair on a smartphone, possibly LG, low-tier phone though, and he wasn't 100% sure if it was a phone that we could repair. He asked the young female caller to stop by for a consult. She had quickly agreed and said, said that she would stop by at around 5.30 p.m. This was a night that I was supposed to get done at 6 p.m. and catch the bus at 6.12. It was a windy, drizzly, early fall night. I remember this because I had my bike with and it became my anchor that night. A little before 6 p.m. this frantic, terrified, bawling 19 to 20 something year old woman came into our tiny shop. I was at the counter, switching out aging price tags and general store maintenance. I looked up at her, confused and willing to help. She looked at me deep in the eyes, asking if Joey was here. At the time, he was using the tiny bathroom in the back, so I had to step in and help out any customers. I told her that he was currently busy and that I was willing to help her. She handed me her smashed cheap phone very timidly. My customer service skills couldn't prepare me for what she was going to say next. She quietly told me that her boyfriend, who was out in his red mini truck in the small front parking lot, had gotten angry and smashed her phone when she tried to call her sister that afternoon. I took the backing off of the phone and tried to research the model for any possible screen repair. No results found. I tried to hand her back the destroyed phone and she pushed it back into my hands with a pleading look. Then the honking commenced. There was this light drizzle outside so our front glass door was covered in beaded drops and was slightly fogged over. I couldn't see who was honking out there. I told her again that I couldn't help and for her to try our cell phone repair competitor down the road. The tears started to really flow down her cheeks and I was freaked out at this point. She kept throwing glances behind her and the honking would not stop. I shook with fear and rage at this point. I myself was in a domestic abuse situation at the time and knew what this girl was experiencing. I broke my lock stare at her and tried to look in our system a second time for a replacement screen. Nothing again. I looked up from my computer and saw a shadowy figure of a young man pacing in front of the store. I was just happy that the honking stopped but I was increasingly shook up. My whole body vibrated with fear, and I whispered across the counter if she needed me to call 911. She slammed her hands down on the counter and said that I couldn't do that, she begged me not to. At this point, Joey came out from the back and asked me what all the honking was from. We had a lot of elderly, farmers, lazy, and disabled customers that would honk their horns for us to pick up heavy battery cores from their cars. He thought that it was one of those situations, but with the looks on our faces, he knew something horrifying was happening. The young guy stopped pacing outside and began banging on our front door. Joey took the girl's phone from my hands and said for me to go in the back and lock the back employee only doors. I did what I was told and grabbed my bag, my bike, and my jacket. I looked at the clock in the back and it read 614. I spent 15 minutes with this girl, both of us feeling like trapped animals. Joey did bodybuilding during his free time and was a gentle non-confronting short but stocky guy. I was a short, obese, kind lady that would respond either of two ways, like a doormat or ready to stand my ground.
around. I knew that I couldn't fight a customer and neither could Joey. Not because of physical reasons, we'd lose our jobs and we had no idea what to do. The young guy threw the door open and the wind kept the door open. He had this manic, hateful look about him. A total predator he was. He was slim but muscular. Early to mid 20s and was soaked by the rain. He took the broken phone off the counter and took the girl in tow. He hurled insults at us and I gave the girl a pitied look. He slammed the door back shut and both Joey and I stood in absolute silence. He snapped out of it and ran to the front door and locked it. I told Joey to call our manager from our store landline and stood around while he did. I noticed that the guy had moved his truck to directly in front of our door. He was watching us from his truck, watching us behind the counter as we were on the phone with our manager. I had to leave to get home, the last possible bus came at 6.42, and I couldn't pedal my way home in the weather and all the circumstances that had just occurred. The time was around 6.18 and I just needed to cross the busy highway and down the sidewalk by an eighth of a mile to the nearest bus stop. Joey, the guy, and I played the waiting game. It was 6.23 when the guy finally left our parking lot. I told Joey that I would leave at 6.25 so I could arrive at the stop safely. Joey opened the front door and I threw myself on top of my bike and pedaled harder than I could ever imagine. Now mind you, our store was in an industrial shopping area at the very edge of town. We worked next to a sub shop and worked across from a strip mall with a bullseye store and a local chain grocery store with other retail stores and a bank all in that in that large lot. It started started to downpour and as I tried to pull out of our parking lot straddling my bicycle, I caught a glimpse of the red truck looping around the sub shop. The highway had dual lanes each way and I had to play real life frogger. If I wanted to make it my destination in one piece, there was a few cars that slowed for me as I hauled myself to the other side of the road. I jumped off on my bike and threw it on top of the curb. I promptly hopped back on and tried to pedal off. My front wheel was stuck in the grassy strip and my right foot had slipped off of the pedal. My shin struck the pedal and I had to act quickly. I grabbed the frame of my bike and jogged awkwardly to the bus stop. The red truck pulled into the bank parking lot of which I had just passed. The truck pulled around and went out through the entrance across from the sub shop and took the closest lane to me. He went at a crawl and turned at the red light so he could circle the main parking lot of the shopping center. There was three ways to get into that parking lot, one to the left, one in the center, slightly off to the right across of the sub shop, and the other far to the right next to the grocery store. I stuck to the sidewalk since it felt safer and was in front of people. The truck patrolled the parking lot, the hunter stalking its prey. I felt cold, sore, and cornered just like an injured animal. There was a couple of cars that pulled into the left entrance of the parking lot, causing the truck to stop from re-entering the lot again. I almost collapsed in the bad small bus stop, and I felt my phone buzz. I saw that I read Joey, so I rested my bike on my person to answer the call. Joey told me that he was watching, and even though he had an elderly couple the store that he was helping that he wouldn't allow the guy to hurt me. I started to cry all this had just gotten to me. The red truck looped around once again and again. I saw the bus pull up early at 639 and I couldn't be happier. I knew the driver since I used the buses to get around town, errand shopping, and to get to and from work. I had my stupid bike to worry about. I hung up the phone with Joey, putting my phone in my jacket pocket, and strapped down my bike in the rack that was in front of the bus. I struggled since I shook and my bike was slick from the rain. I got on the bus and turned to the open bus doors and saw that the truck took a left at the center entrance of the lot. I could finally let my guard down. I sat at the front of the bus and my hand shook at trying to get the $1.25 for the fare. The driver said that it was okay and that I could take my time with the change. I kept my backpack on and pulled my damp phone from my pocket, dialing Joey's number letting him know that I was fine. In under 15 minutes I made it to my apartment safe but deeply disturbed. I took my bike in so it wouldn't draw any attention to where I lived. All this gave me an idea to leave my own domestic abuse situation. To this day I wonder about that girl and hope that somebody more daring and stronger than me called the cops on her abuser. That she had the strength to leave that violent man for her to write her own story and to recover from all of it. I am currently doing significantly better in life and finally have my own car. And I live a couple states away safely from my past life. Even though I'm states away and it's been three years now. For a little background, I'm a 27 year old female and I recently just moved into a nice apartment in a safe neighborhood with my two dogs Charles and Wigwam. Charles is a corgi slash German Shepherd mix and is the most loving but overly obnoxious dog while Wigwam is a Lhasa Apso who is quiet, sweet, and most definitely scared of his own shadow. I've only been in my new place for about a month and after this experience, I highly doubt I'm gonna make it here for the duration of my year long lease. The way these apartments are set up is that 
each floor has its own set of doors that lead to four apartments and a fire escape door that only opens from the inside. I'm on the back side of the building which places my patio about 10-ish feet from the fire escape stairs. I take my dogs out three times a day, midnight being the latest I will go out by myself and every time I leave my apartment, I put the bar lock on my patio door and lock my front door without fail. About a week ago, we had a snowstorm and I cracked my patio door because, well, I love cold weather and I'm a adult and if I want to watch the snowfall then I can do that. It was around 11pm and I decided that since it was getting late, I should take the dogs out for the night and since they both hate snow, this would be a quick trip. I go to lock the patio door and decide against it because I'm on the 5th floor and I'm only going to be outside for a few minutes. I get the dogs ready, grab my keys, and lock my door as I leave the apartment. I get down to the designated pet area with my beloved snow hating dogs and let them do their thing and then back to the apartment we go and we get back in safely or so I thought. This is where I thought I was losing my mind but in actuality stuff was about to get real. As soon as we walk into the apartment my dogs run over to the patio door and I notice the door is shut and the bar is locked. Mistake number two, I immediately think that's strange but didn't connect the dots. I go into the kitchen to get dog treats and both dogs start going crazy and growling at a large cedar chest in my living room and as I'm walking to see what all the commotion is about, I see a pair of eyes creeping from under the chest lid. I stood there for about 5 seconds before I realized what I was seeing and calmly walked backwards to my front door, opened it and told my dogs let's go outside and they ran out, without leashes and I immediately get them and myself in my car, lock the doors and call the police. The police show up in less than 5 minutes and they go up to my apartment and after about 20 minutes, two officers are dragging a 40ish year old guy out of my building in cuffs and the plot thickens. This dude had been watching me since I moved in and had been stalking out my place, waiting for an opportunity to get inside because he knew I lived alone. If that's not creepy enough already, he had a fanny pack since it's still 1990 and he had a pocket knife, needles, ketamine, and a picture of me from the day I moved in and his plan was to sneak in through my patio door, wait for me to fall asleep and whatever knows what else. Needless to say, I didn't sleep for days because I thought he would come back. Luckily, the guy is still in jail but I'll never forget those eyes. When I was 11, almost 12, the woman living above me was a coke dealer. The night of my 12th birthday, she went missing. Not long after, her boyfriend came down to ask if he could use our phone. This was 2004, so having a cell phone was more of an exception than a rule, at least in my area. For a little context, I was home alone at the time while my mom was at work about a 5 minute walk away. My mom had let our neighbor and her boyfriend come in to use our phone several other times before, so I assumed nothing was wrong with it and let him in, bringing him into the living room which is towards the front of our apartment to use the phone in there. He picks up the receiver, dials a number, waits a few seconds, then hangs up on the phone. He does this a couple more times before the front door of the building opens. You can easily hear the front door open from where we were. It's a heavy door, the walls are thin, and the way our building is set up, it's a small, old single family house converted into apartments. Me and my mom's apartment were the only ones on the first floor and our upstairs neighbor's apartment was the only one above us. Irrelevant, but there was also a much smaller apartment below us. My neighbor's boyfriend looked at me, put his pointer finger to his lips like he was just trying to shush me, and told me not to tell anyone he was there before speed walking to my room at the other end of the apartment. I watched my bedroom door close right before there was a loud, hard, cop-like knock on the door. My jaw dropped as I opened the door to see a cop. He asked if my neighbor's boyfriend was there and, being scared, I stammered out, yeah, he just went into my room. The officer asked if he could come in, which I agreed to, and as he was coming in, he asked if I could let his partner in the back door and lead them into my room. We walked together to the back of the apartment and I let his partner in. The back door to the apartment was right next to my bedroom door, but we had to walk around the kitchen table to get there. There was just barely enough space between the two doors to fit a narrow, rectangular table against it without blocking the path to either door. After I I let them into my room, I watched as they pulled my neighbor's boyfriend out of my bedroom closet. As they brought him out of my room and towards the back door, which just led to an enclosed fire escape, they told me to go wait in the living room while they brought him out the back door. I walked back to the living room and, after they closed the door, I couldn't hear what they were saying but I could hear the distinct sound of metal clicking and quickly realized that he had just been handcuffed. Still scared, I waited for the police car to drive away before grabbing my keys, making sure the back door was locked, and locking the front door on my way out before running to my mom's work crying. Pretty sure I cut the 5 minute trip into about 2 minutes. And I've never been a fast runner. I was fueled entirely on adrenaline and fear at that point and I just wanted my mom. When I told her what had happened, my mom was pissed that he had used me the way he had, hiding out in a child's bedroom closet, of all places, to try to keep the cops from finding him. She gave me a short but gentle lecture that night about not letting people in 
and to use the phone, telling me that I was not to let people use up her phone, even if I knew them unless she was home. I don't want to know what exactly he was wanted for, nor do I want to know what could have happened if the cops had not shown up. I don't know if he had known that the cops were on their way and had to come to my apartment specifically to hide from them, or if he was up to something else and knew that the cops were at the front door of the building. Alright, so that's it. I hope you enjoyed this compilation. Let me know down in the comments below if you want to hear another one of these compilations every once in a while. But as always, have a nice day.